jump in. Uh, okay, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. And the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. We do have some <clears throat> changes here. Um, so we're not going to be taking up uh, chapter 13 of the ordinances at all. That's item 14 in the agenda. Uh, and the other thing that I would like to do is uh, move the strategic plan um, item to the end. And uh, also, Tom, I, I see that you are here already. And so I'm tempted to move that item uh, up. Um, I know, like, I had a couple of, like, a couple of requests to move some stuff up, but I don't see them here. And, and uh, kind of wanted I wish I could do all the items first, but you're you're here. So let's uh, move up um, the uh, down home parklet reuse uh, to let's let's do that just after the parking garage uh, update. Um, unless there's any other thoughts or objections to any of that. Okay, great. All right, so without objection, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved. Uh, so general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on an item that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, and if you would try to keep your comments to two minutes, that would be great. Uh, so, and then that'll be true for uh, other comments um, from the public through the meeting. Um, does anybody have an item they would like to raise? Um, and uh, Cameron, would you mind like unmuting everybody real quick just to make sure everybody's got that opportunity? Anybody have an item they'd like to raise? Oh. Okay, all right, cool, thanks. Um, so we're gonna move on the, oopsies. Uh, yep, so we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion uh, regarding the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. Okay, um, any further discussion? Um, I just want to note uh, that there's a um, local emergency uh, management plan in there, and I'm just glad to see that. Um, just wanted to highlight that before we passed over it too quickly. Do you want to say anything about that? Like what that's for or anything? Um, not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> I do know there's something that needs to be signed though, Donna, is that right? That you are approving? Um, so yes, just... there was something that there was, um, we need to be able to, um, apply for a grant and it requires the city's authorization uh, for us to just um, get that confirmation that we're eligible to apply. And we submitted that late. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have an updated. Um, no, that, that's okay. okay. Just even that background is helpful. So, um, okay, any further discussion? So it's really just a reminder that we need you guys to come in and sign. That'll be yeah. at the police department tomorrow. Yes. Great. Okay. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Okay. So the consent agenda passes. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, the above and beyond award. So I'm going to turn this over to Bill. And I'm going to turn it right over to Cameron. All right. <laughs> Um, so I'm really excited to um, sort of announce the continued success of our Above and Beyond um, Employee Recognition Program. I think that um, in times like this, it's really important for our staff to be able to shout each other out. They've all been going above and beyond. This was a very exciting month for me because we had many, many submissions and multiple people got submitted multiple times. Um, but this month, sorry, the month of April, um, Norma Maurice from our Community Services Department um, won our Above and Beyond Award. 
Um, she is our office manager for community services, which is the park department, the rec department, and the senior center. Norma's nomination highlighted her grace in assisting residents during this difficult time, her dedication to the city, and her ability to sort of plug herself into where she can to help out in the workplace. Um, Norma is the only admin um, uh, office worker still um, in our community services department right now. The rest are all on voluntary furlough. So she's really had to shoulder a lot of responsibilities that she didn't have before. She is our sole office support staff right now. And um, in her nomination, her nominator stated that she demonstrates every day that she's an engaged, caring, and motivated to get the job done. She has skillful and warm customer service to put the public at ease. And she has cultivated great relationships with our volunteers, instructors, and community partners. She's constantly on the lookout on how she can contribute to facility improvements and safety measures and to create better efficiencies for our senior activity center and other community service divisions. She's shown amazing commitment to the city in the face of our pandemic situation and remained in our office and facility as the sole employee on site where others are working remotely. She's also stepped up as the lead person to distribute our feast to go meals outside twice weekly to those who need extra food. And she manages duties in the account payable and donor acknowledgement divisions, which she wasn't doing before. Um, they, they sort of concluded by saying, it's hard to imagine the senior center ship sailing without Norma's competent leadership. So we really do appreciate her and thank her for all the work she's been doing. Yay, congratulations, Norma. That is a wonderful uh, praise and uh, well-deserved award. Uh, all right. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we're going to uh, jump into the... Um, uh, appointments that we have to make. And the first one is uh, to the, uh, uh, oh, sorry, uh, the Social and Economic Justice uh, Advisory Committee. There are a number of seats uh, open on this committee and we had one applicant um, that was um, uh, Bogdan Laurentiu. And uh, I think I saw, yep. Bogdan, you're on here. Um, uh, Morgan, would you like to introduce yourself to the council and tell us about your interest in this committee? Hello, everybody. Uh, very good to, to be here and uh, thank you for having the opportunity. Uh, my name is Bogdan. I immigrated here from Romania in 2011 with just $500 and, and a lined up job. Uh, I am grateful and deeply humbled for all the opportunities that I got uh, in these nine years. Um, is going to be in June. Uh, I am the store manager for TJ Maxx. Uh, we will reopen soon uh, before everybody's uh, going to ask me. Um, I am running out of candles, so we need to open. Um, other than that, um, I finished uh, college for computer science and one year of master's degree uh, for uh, banking systems on the IT side. I'm currently uh, involved and an alumni of the partnership. They are based in Boston. They are focused on teaching, training, mentoring uh, minorities, so to speak, in all aspects of uh, corporate America and not just that, um, in terms of leadership, mentoring, and supporting others. Um, I'm interested uh, in, in this committee uh, a little bit uh, for the social and economic justice. I am a strong believer that everybody, regardless of where you come from, what opportunities you had growing up or what life threw at you, you should have the same opportunities as the person next to you, regardless if you went to college or if you only finished high school or elementary school. And um, unfortunately, there are still cases out there. Uh, the governor mentioned one um, earlier today, or it was yesterday, unless I'm mistaken, about uh, a little incident uh, with racism. So uh, we really need to tackle this, and it's my strong belief that um, it's not going to happen overnight, and definitely it's not going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but uh, if we all put in the effort and we actually do something about it, rather than just being vocal about it, then we have a better chance of expediting that process and making sure that everybody at the end of the day, they have uh, 
everything at their power and the information at their fingertips to be successful in life. After all, this is America. And it is my strong belief that if anybody can make it somewhere, they can make it here. Um, so that, that's all I have. Again, thank you very much for allowing me to, to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Bogdan. Um, I have one question for you, um, which is, uh, would you prefer to have a one-year seat or a two-year seat on this committee? I'll take any. <laughs> so uh, allow me to be, uh, can I elaborate a little bit? Sure. Maybe for just a minute, I'm not going to speak a lot, even though sometimes I do have the tendency of. Um, I am looking for opportunities to give back. Like I said, I'm humble and grateful for everything this country has provided to me so far since I came here. Uh, it wasn't easy. I started from the bottom as a mm -hmm. server in a restaurant and a temp employee in retail uh, at TJ Maxx and at Walmart. And I've had, uh, at any point until probably a year ago, I had two jobs constantly to kind of have the life that I wanted to have. And, uh, you know, no, no excuses on that. And I'm, I'm really happy that I did that. Uh, but I'm looking for opportunities to give back, uh, to give a little bit back because I got so much and I had a lot of people that supported me and mentored me and sponsored me and really believed in me um, and some that didn't. It, it is what it is. Uh, so I guess uh, I'm just looking for an opportunity to give back. Um, so Thank I would you. take uh, any chance you're going to give me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, sure. And apologies, Bogdan. Uh, I really liked your speech, so I'm going <laughs> to make a motion to appoint you to the two-year term of the uh, Social and Economic uh, Justice Advisory Committee. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. And I'm open to questions if you guys have any questions for me, of course. I'll, I'll second that motion. Okay. I think, great. Uh, also, Donna, I think you also were trying to second, but you were muted. So... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Thank you. And uh, congratulations, Bogdan. Uh, Thank, you. Happy serve. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I promise to make you guys proud. <laughs> great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, all right. So the next one is the uh, Energy Advisory Committee. Um, for that committee, I, um, there, I'm st still loading on my computer right now, but I believe we had something like four candidates for six seats and um, so that would have been uh, Jeff Fitzgerald, Donald DeWall, uh, Kate Stevenson, and uh, Ad oh, David Weir. Um, and I think I, uh, so David, you're here. Um, David, do you wanna introduce yourself to the council and tell us about your interest in uh, this committee? Um, I'm just gonna put that out again. David, can you, um, can you hear me? Would you, would you like to introduce yourself to the, to the council? No, I'm sorry about that. I'm having a little bit of bandwidth issue here, but- Oh, uh, yeah. Talk to you now. yeah. Uh, oh, I'm going to leave the video off my bandwidth a little though. Uh, my name is David Weir. Uh, I am an architectural designer. I'm from Montpelier from Oregon uh, last July with my wife here uh, and looking to get involved in community in a way and hoping that, uh, I think you're talking about the energy commission at the moment, right? Yes. Uh, I think I applied for both the energy commission um, and then a regional plan. Uh, both of those kind of start for an architect so actually right now uh, my uh kind of uh help develop some uh, uh energy programs here in Montpelier help to, uh, push on energy programs in Montpelier uh towards kind of that zero So David, you're cutting out there a little bit, um, but uh, does anyone have any questions for David? Nope, not me. Okay. Uh, okay, so again, we have four people in six um, seats. Um, they're all two-year terms. Uh, 
Uh, does anyone want to make a motion? Uh, David, yep, you, or Dan, you're still on uh, mute. I'll, I'll make a motion to appoint the uh, four candidates. I believe it's David Weir, Donald Duvall, uh, Kate Stevenson, and Jeff Fitzgerald to each to two year seats on the en Energy Advisory Committee. Second. Okay, further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, great. Well, uh, congratulations, David and others. Um, thanks for stepping up. Okay, uh, the Recreation Advisory uh, uh, Committee um, had one open seat and one applicant, Scott Van Beck. I thought maybe I saw Scott on here. Is Scott on? He was. Yeah, he yeah. is. I have unmuted him if he wants to speak. Oh, oh, there you are. Oh, right in front of me. Uh, Scott, would you like to introduce yourself to the uh, to the council and tell us about your interest in this committee? So oh, he's still on mute. Scott, you're still on mute. There you go. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Bambeck, and. Uh, my wife and I moved to uh, Montpelier from uh, Houston, Texas three years ago. And um, uh, Sarah serves as the uh, chief financial officer for uh, National Life uh, up on the hill. And um, I'm a, a career public, uh, public school educator. I worked 35 years in uh, Houston, uh, left as a uh, regional superintendent and then ran a uh, educational nonprofit uh, in Houston for 10 years. And uh, one of my earliest memories of uh, uh, living in Montpelier uh, was uh, uh, getting introduced to a noontime basketball at the uh, rec center and uh, have really enjoyed uh, the, uh, the times down there. Uh, Love the, uh, the pool. I uh, like to play some tennis with uh, my uh, little 10 year old mentee. Uh, I'm a mentor with uh, Girls Boys First uh, here in uh, Montpelier. And um, it was actually uh, Chris Hancock and I uh, were talking, and uh, Chris is on the uh, rec committee. And he had told me of the, uh, the opening. And uh, so he introduced me to the uh, director. And uh, and um, um, then I saw it posted that uh, it was uh, it was time to uh, apply. So I sent the application in. Um, I've been around athletics and recreation uh, most of my life, and uh, I think uh, a strong community uh, is defined by uh, many uh, variables. But uh, one of the most important variables is uh, how healthy and uh, how recreational the, uh, the community is. So I'm really uh, excited to uh, serve uh, the city of Montpelier uh, in this role. Super. Um, questions or a motion? I move that we appoint uh, Scott Van Beck to the Recreation Advisory Board. I'll second. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Hi. Hi. Great. Thank you. And uh, congratulations, Scott. Thanks for stepping up. Awesome. Thanks to the city council and to the mayor. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving along, we have uh, an, uh, another appointment to make to the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission. And for this, we have two applicants. So um, David Weir and Marcella Dent. Um, and so, uh, David, do you want to uh, speak at all to your interest in serving on the on the planning commission, or, or I'm sorry, not the planning commission, the um, uh, central right, the central regional planning commission? There we go. Uh, sure. Yeah. In addition to my interest in architecture, my background in architecture, I've been in uh, 
sustainable practices on a region level. Um, the, uh, food systems um, and and looking through the uh, Central Vermont Planning uh, website and realized that they kind of had a hand in all of that. Uh, so I was hoping that I could do that. Uh, my kind of very background in our design. Thing. Great. Um, so for this appointment, because there are two people for one seat, uh, I think it is very likely that we may go into executive session. Um, and the council has another uh, link to uh, to do that. Is there um, uh, a motion? Yes, Jack. Pursue, I move pursuant to one BSA section 313A3 that we go into executive session to consider the appointment of a public official. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Um, opposed? Okay, so uh, we will be right back. We leave this uh, so, meeting. So yeah. council members leave this meeting, everyone else can stay. Right, and logged into the Executive session, please. Great. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, is there a motion? I move that we appoint Marcella Dent to uh, represent the city of Montpelier on the regional planning. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, none opposed. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, David, we want to thank you for uh, your um, uh, application to this as well. And uh, you know, I want to acknowledge that we're, we're psyched to have you on the Energy Committee and want to um, share the love. So um, anyway, thank you again for stepping up and uh, congratulations, uh, Marcella. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, we moved the strategic plan to the end. And uh, so the next item is the uh, parking garage update. Um, and so for this, I will turn it over to Bill. Oh, actually, maybe I should just clarify. Um, so the way we're gonna just organize this time is uh, we're gonna hear from city staff. Um, and then uh, I know there's a number of folks who would like to uh, make some comments. So we'll, we'll go straight from there to uh, public comment. And, uh, and then from, from there, the council will um, have a discussion um, and we'll go from there. All right, uh, go for it. Great, thanks. Uh, we have some of our, um consulting experts and legal experts on the line. I think David Rue is on, Stephanie Clark. Not sure if Greg is on. Yes, Greg is on. There he is, right in front of you. There's David. Um, so basically, as you recall, at our, our last meeting, we outlined uh, a general change in design that was uh, trying to address some of the concerns that have been raised over the years. Uh, and we were continuing to work on uh, our numbers to present where, where that was financially, what the costs were. Um, so we're in better shape to do that at this meeting. Um, I think the design has made a couple of tweaks since you last saw it, which Greg can talk about. I think David's prepared to give us an update on the case and Stephanie's here to walk us through the finances. And then obviously any other questions that people have. I don't know who's going first. Dan, going first? <laughs> I wasn't uh, sure if I had the if I had the control. Um, we we know how I feel about that. Um, so, <laughs> um, Cameron, I sent over the PowerPoint just now. I don't know if it's better that you share it or I share it. I've given you permission to share your screen if you would like to. Okay. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> Is there any way you can do it? Yeah, yeah, I'm a little I afraid that I'm not going to do this right. I heard someone say it's a, a learning curve for everybody. Yeah, there's a lot of technology going on. But we are going to start. I can I can start off just by saying hi. I'm um, Stephanie Clark with White and Burke. I have met most of you, but I have not met all of you in person. 
Um, and tonight we're just going to give you an update from where we were back in April. Last you saw us, we presented the new shorter, um, east-west shorter footprint of the garage. And we said we'd come back to you with numbers with a budget. And we also want to provide you with the legal update. So Dave Rue is on the line to do the legal update. And then I'll walk through some of the design tweaks that we've had um, as we've done some value engineering over the last month. And then we can get into the numbers. And um, if we need further um, conversation, we'll go from there. So uh, Cameron is loading that up. And uh, I think starting on slide three is where Dave is going to jump in with the legal update. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Dave Rue from Stetzel Page and Fletcher. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me okay. Uh, my laptop has a bad habit of mysteriously cutting my mic and audio without me knowing it in the middle of me talking. So um, I, I can see Mayor Watson on my screen. So Mayor, just wave at me if my uh, if if my audio cuts out. Uh, since uh, we last spoke back on April eighth. Um, we had a very favorable decision from the Environmental Division of Vermont Superior Court. Uh, the court found uh, that the municipal parking garage was a development for municipal purposes on less than 10 acres of land. Um, so it dismissed the appellant's appeal uh, of the Act 250 approval for both the hotel and the parking garage. Uh, what the court's ruling means basically is that while the hotel is uh, still a subject to Act 250 as a housing project, uh, the city's garage project is no longer subject to Act 250. Uh, in response to that favorable ruling, uh, the appellants, uh, the, the named appellants are Les Blomberg and Dan Costin, uh, have filed motions to amend or alter the judgment. And if that's the court doesn't amend its judgment, they uh, have said publicly that they're going to file an appeal with the Vermont Supreme Court. Um, it, when the court's looking at these motions to amend that were just filed, including our response, uh, it, it has wide discretion uh, to decide the motion. Um, usually they're rarely granted. Uh, and we think that the court's going to stick by its original decision because its, uh, its reasoning was, was pretty sound. Um, by their motion to amend, uh, one of the things that is indicative of the, from the filing is that the appellants are now uh, challenging not only the parking garage, but also the hotel portion of the project. Uh, previous public statements have uh, indicated that they uh, supported the, ho the new hotel but by continuing to fight and asserting in their motion to amend that the decision uh, that the court should not have dismissed the appeal, uh, it's clear they want to continue to fight and uh, bring the hotel portion of the project into their challenge. Uh, the Vermont Natural Resources Board also filed a motion to amend the judgment and they adopted a jurisdictional argument uh, that the appellants previously made um, it appears that the goal of both parties in filing these motions and instead of accepting the court's ruling is to increase the cost to the city and delay the project even further. Uh, in the zoning approvals, uh, there's a separate appeal of the zone of the site plan and subdivision approvals for the garage. Uh, that's proceeding now with discovery after we won a number of rulings as I described back in April. Uh, that limited the issues from roughly 30 down to about nine, and that dismissed uh, 16 of the 18 members of the appellant group from the case. Um, so at, at this point in time, we're proceeding with discovery in uh, the zoning appeals, and we are hoping to stick to a uh, fall trial. Uh, we can't say for sure because we don't know what the emergency closure of the courts uh, what the impact of that is going to be. Uh, as, as many people probably know, all courts have been closed as a result of COVID-19 for anything other than emergency matters. Uh, but nonetheless, we're hopeful that uh, the schedule was set far enough out that we're gonna be able to stick to it. So that's, that's where things stand right now. Uh, we've had a number of favorable decisions and if, if the counselors have any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them.
I'm not seeing any questions from council at this point. Am I wrong about that? Okay. Okay. Um, moving on then. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah. Next Thanks. slide. So I'm going to quickly go through um, just the slight changes we've made to the design that have resulted have been a result of the value engineering process that we've gone through, looking for cost savings for the budget. And we were able, and I say we, but that's really not me. This has been a huge lift from the architectural construction um, team to achieve a lot of savings without changing the footprint or the general site design or the overall aesthetics, but to see a lot of cost savings. So we have now gone back to the interior layout. All the changes that have been done have been mostly interior, which have had some exterior impacts, but the interior layout going to a helical design, which is the sloped floors, that's what we had originally. And we thought we could go to the flat floors last month, but it, it really doesn't work um, financially to do that. So going back to the helical design, it actually reduces our height of our building by two to three feet, which is a good thing. And it increases our total number of spaces, which is also a good thing. We originally had a 348 space garage. That was what our approvals are for, but we have seen that number go down and go back up. It will be around 348, or it could be as high as 358. That's the current layout. But as these de designs evolve, you see spaces come and go a little bit depending on circulation, turning movements, accessibility, ventilation, et cetera. And the windows um, on the building, which you could see in some of the, in the renderings and in the elevations have been adjusted slightly based on that interior change. You can also see that for value engineering purposes for cost savings, we had to remove the glazing on the elevator shaft. And we've chosen to go with a hybrid steel cast in place concrete structure, which um, will have finishing elements included in that for longevity. These were all made to realize good cost savings, very significant. Um, but truthfully, this is gonna be subject to further design tweaks based on accommodations, negotiations with abutting properties, stormwater permitting, value engineering. And we expect that um, those things will hopefully continue to keep reducing the cost um, in doing so. We have a more technical memo that we'll be sending to counselors tomorrow that has the real nitty gritty level of detail of some of those changes, um, the spe specifics of measurements that have changed, if that's the level of interest you're interested in. Um, uh, this also resulting in the, the slope back to the slope floors does get back at that question. I know someone had raised previously about reuse um, the garage is being built for parking and it's a long-term investment for the city and parking. We have not um, intended for any reuse of this building down the line. That became more of a possibility if you had flat floors, but with the ramp floors, that's not really a possibility. Um, again, that wasn't the priority of council in the city to begin with. So um, we're not losing anything here, but that, that is the reality of going to the slope, back to the slope ramp floors. Um, you can see on the next slide, we provided these two comparisons um, that we provided in the pack yesterday. There's the entry. This is the entry view, the top photo from the view you saw in April to the view now. You can see it's not a significant change to the overall aesthetic, to the overall look or scale. Um, and in the following frame, the uh, next slide has the same to be said of the aerial view from the southeast. You can see there a little bit clearer the change to the sloping. With that, I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions on design. We have Greg Rabideau, the architect who has, uh, I, God hope he didn't age more since you saw him in April because he's done <laughs> a lot of work to realize these cost savings, but he's here if you have any questions. Uh, go ahead, Jack. Um, thank you. I didn't do all the dimensions. Is it accurate that the building footprint is basically the same now as it was uh, discussed back in April? Correct. Yeah, exactly. As a matter of fact, precisely the same. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Donna. 
Um, I just want to mention way back when we first looked at the flat floor, we did have you price out what would happen if we put enough steel in it to repurpose it. And it was so costly, we decided not to advance it. I just don't want people to forget that when we cost it out before, it wasn't feasible. That's so I'm quite comfortable going back to the slope. Thank you. Thank and you. I appreciate the, uh, the, the drawings really help to see. Thank you. Um, David, do you want to add something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, these two elevations, these are just two elevations. Uh, we will have the rest available uh, and posted on the city's website in the coming days. Uh, Dan. Uh, I had a question. Have, have any of these renderings been done as sort of night views as to how the illumination is going to look? Um, and along those lines, this, this is our second related question is, am I understanding correctly that there's going to be sort of less windows out to out of the building? And uh, within that, will any of the illumination be affected? as to what it's going to send out into the night? Uh, well, in the first case, I can say that we, we haven't done any night renderings. That's certainly something we could do. Uh, you know, I guess I'd have to talk to uh, Bill Fraser and, and the rest of the city staff and talk about, you know, what that might cost if it's, if it's necessary. We have done photo, uh, photo, uh, Okay. Uh, metric photometric yeah, yeah. analysis of the uh, site plan so that we know that the uh, the lighting as proposed performs to city standards in terms of the foot candles on the surfaces but i think you're getting at a more of a night sky kind of thing right well i i am although the the photovoltaics i think uh, answer uh, my primary question because i i just i noticed i was sitting there thinking about the old design that it had more windows in there and whether that was going to make this building pop a little bit more against the sort of background of the night. Um, and that really is my second set of questions is, you know, am I correct in understanding that as a result of this, there's gonna be less um, windows or, or uh, openings to the, from the building which would be illuminated inside to the outside? Well, um, not tr truly not. I, I think um, the one place where we're showing more solid wall than what, what you had previously seen is up adjacent to the hotel itself, where the two buildings face one another. But the south side, say, facing the bike path or the, or the east side facing the Haney lot, have more or less the same disposition of windows uh, in more or less the same set of relationships. Um, we have a couple of things going for us in terms of the in terms of controlling that lighting. We are still showing the uh, uh, sort of fiberglass art scrims that sort of cover up the larger openings. I think the openings with the green walls are going to offer a very filtered sunlight once the vegetation establishes. I mean, not sunlight, but uh, emitting light from inside the building. Uh, right. Generally speaking, I think the, our biggest concern would be the pole mounted lights on the upper deck. Um, because close down and around the building where we've shown walkways, that, that lighting is sort of built into walls and stuff. It's a little more discreet and, and, and it's all down lighting. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm completely answering your question, but I, I don't think the change from April to May is really going to have a dramatic impact on how much light emits from the project. Uh, we're just going to kind of go along with uh, uh, EIS on any standards for, for um, Lighting performance and and your your uh, zoning regs to try to minimize light trespass. So, thanks. Okay, thanks. Any other clarifying questions council may have for um, architect or about the finances? Okay. All right. So. We'll go oh. into the finances now. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Go ahead. No. <laughs> um, I haven't even gotten into it yet. <laughs> so, um, so in 2018, when we had the bond vote in November, we had done the estimates for the garage project as a whole, which was a combination of the hard construction costs, which was 9.2 million and other costs, which was 1.3 million. That was a combination of other costs was like brownfield remediation and garage equipment. 
um, like the electric charging stations and snow removal equipment and also soft costs. In 2020, a year and a half later now, we have seen that estimate for the hard construction go up. Now that looks like a modest amount by 100,000 to 9.3 million, but that number still, still may change as we'll talk about, as you saw in my memo. But the other costs projection is up by uh, 1, 1.4 million, so up to 2.7 million for a total of a 12 point million dollar project. And this is an estimate that assumes the appeal is going to continue, and it is that, but it's making the assumption that it's not remarkably more complicated than we're estimating. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of that is subjective, is, is yet to be seen. Um, on the next slide, you'll see uh, to date, we have spent 850,000 over the last two years in preparing for this project and doing the work that needs to be done to get this project teed up. But 250,000 of that is, has been spent on the appeal. And that is direct costs on appeal. On the next slide, um, the updated estimate is showing that this cost increase is the result of four major factors, one being the appeal. We are projecting around $550,000 of costs will be spent on the appeal by the time this is done. If, if all of our projections hold true. And what's not reflected is that time is really the one of the, the main drivers of this, that it's not direct expenses that can be shown linked directly to the appeal, but as time has gone on, other soft costs have accrued due to that project delay. Because as things progress, they get, they get delayed, they get stale, they have to be updated, and things have to, work has to be redone. That's just the nature of you can imagine if you've ever done a home renovation project, the longer it draws out, the long, the more costs accumulate. We've had some site complications, um, additional brownfield um, investigation and archaeological investigation that came out of the Act 250 process. We've had um, negotiations and accommodations with the butters that have increased costs. The brownfield in particular um, those costs are high. We have an estimate, we've assumed the high end of the estimate, but that's because of the um, contamination, the disposal of the contaminated soils. There's no good way to dispose of those soils. There's no good options um, for local disposal or reuse on site. Um, it's just the nature of these kinds of urban soils. So that's a really high number. Um, but like this cat, <laughs> Uh, is the is it going up or is it going down? Is the number um, going to is that that number going to change? Yes, but by how much and in which direction we don't know, and that's because we've made some conservative assumptions here. Um, the, for instance, the high end estimate of the brownfield remediation. We've also built in several contingencies, and we've assumed a flat tax increment from the Capital Plaza project. So that's on the conservative side. It also doesn't factor in um, the funding that we're pursuing or the additional savings that may be realized through value engineering. It also doesn't account though for time and unpredictability in the process. In 2022, when this project is, when we may, may see this project break ground based on the appeal process, um, time it will take to get through it, we don't know. At the earliest, it could be 2022. What will be the costs then? We don't know. This 12, point, this $12 million is a 2020 cost estimate. Historical data has shown us that the costs can come down some during a recession, and we don't know where we're going to be in that recession, but it's not a guarantee. So if we are looking at projecting this out a few years, we may want to assume a modest two to 4% annual inflation. Um, staying on this slide, we, we are looking at savings. Um, the process is ongoing. We're evaluating the equipment options, ways to cost share, looking for further tweaks to the design that don't compromise long-term longevity, uh, quality and longevity, which is a fine line to walk. We wanna be careful with that. Um, but the question is, you know, can we can we afford this, and what, what how will we? It, will there be a gap? Because our 10.5 million number was based on parking revenue and TIF revenue. 
that the $12 million garage may have to factor in some additional funding, um, may pull, we could potentially, if by the time we're ready to construct, use TIF, the TIF fund, if the TIF fund has realized additional increment that's not been used elsewhere in the city, that's what that's there for, is to pay down TIF debt. Um, we don't know what the bond bank rates will be, and maybe we even can find some other lower cost, um, lower interest loans. Um, we have a mix of taxable and non-taxable debt through the bond bank, so maybe going with um, other options for lower interest loans would be helpful. So these numbers aren't completely final. Um, the federal stimulus money has come up as a question too. Could we potentially um, be eligible because this will be a project that will get people back to work. It's an infrastructure project, um, but any delays and getting caught in the appeal process are going to uh, slow that down and, and increase our risk of being eligible for that funding. So depending on where we land with that cost after the litigation and our, after our continued efforts, we, may, um, we need to assess that gap routinely and figure out what that gap is and how we can fund it using parking rates. And at, at the very last option, it would be um, increasing property taxes, which is something we don't wanna do. And it's something we've not been planning on doing from the beginning, but with these additional costs, that is a risk. But there's all these other funding mechanisms and other ways we wanna explore. We remain committed to the project, we being the entire city team, um, the appeal and the delay have and will continue to increase costs, but it's the will of the voters who approve the project by a significant margin to see this, draw, this garage constructed. And so the work on the financials is ongoing. Um, we're keenly aware of how important this infrastructure and construction project will be to the economic recovery of downtown Montpelier and downtown businesses. So that's why we're here tonight to um, ask you to approve the design change that we proposed that we've proposed and with this point in time update get that approval to proceed so we can continue in the court process with the next steps that Dave outlined. And I can answer any other questions on the finances. Okay, do any uh, counselors have any clarifying questions uh, about the finances. Okay. Oops, sorry. Ann. Oh yeah, go ahead, Jay. Um, I just want to uh, throw in a couple points. Um, thanks, Stephanie. I appreciate all the additional information. Um, I think that you know, going back a couple slides and looking at the original budget, one is um, that assuming around a, a, approximately a ten percent um, overall project cost, give or take a percentage point or two, um, is totally you know, standard for this type of project. So I think that the original assumptions were, um, were okay, if anything, they maybe were a little bit low. Obviously we're, we're dealing with the, with the appeals and so that may push us up a little bit higher, but understanding that a project of this scope requires this level of initial investment and long-term and continued expense is normal. Um, it's exactly when I, you know, participated in the building of the new playground at the elementary school. That is exactly how we built in, um, how we built our budget moving forward. So I think that your numbers are right on as far as that goes. To use that as a segue, I also think that one of the things that we did with the successful construction of that playground was look at um, possible uh, construction and construction changes to help bring it into um, closer into original budget planning. Now, I, I, pre I, I get that building a playground was, is a kind of a lot more mod modular, like we could sort of take this structure out and that one out. And, you know, you alluded to Stephanie, to the value engineering, and you've obviously already gone through that over the last month, but there may be some things that we could look at as we are getting towards a point where we decide whether or not we're going to commit to the to the ultimate the financing and the the the, the contracted budget 
that there are some things that maybe could come out of the design that maybe could then come back in as we work through the construction pro pro process. Um, you know, with the playground, we, just like you have done, we were very conservative with uh, the brown, you know, brownfield and remediation and, you know, other contingencies like digging up, a, you know, a, an oil drum, like you, you don't know what you're going to find. So you want to have those contingencies and you want to be conservative. But as you get through the construction progress, you find, hey, we, we, we haven't had to spend on these contingencies so we could bring these pieces back to the to, to the project design. So it seems like there might be an opportunity instead of just assuming a, a larger number, this is taking out the legal piece, but in terms of construction costs, there might be some ways that we can look at entering into the construction process on budget and then realizing if we don't have to spend on the contingencies that we can then bring some features back into the project. Yeah, if I could so, jump in on this that. Is all, I, I appreciate this is like a totally like a, um, it, it's, a it, it's a chicken or an egg and it's a back and forth. And it's, we, we, there's, it's so often we have to deal with real time decisions around budget. But if we have options in front of us in terms of give or take relative con to contingencies and features, I think that will help us keep it closer to the original budget as we move closer to construction. Sorry, Bill, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's okay. I, I interrupt you. Just a couple things. One, if you notice, the actual construction cost is about what it was a couple years ago, uh, in part due to the work that we're doing. It's the other related soft costs, and, including running it out. And that is the product of a lot of hard work by, by Stephanie and Greg and, and our DEW team, Tom McCardle. Uh, you know, really working on this. There, as you say, there's not as many moving costs, moving pieces to this. Uh, one of the things that we've been very uh, hard on is keeping the design and the extra parts of the project consistent with what was presented to the community and presented through the design review process. So some of the external treatments and those kinds of things, the bike path, connections, those were all things that were identified as being very important. And so, you know, when you start talking about leaving things out, that's what starts getting left out is the art on the side of the wall or the, the green screens or the bike path connection. And those, I think we've been, we feel were part of the package that was presented. So we're trying to keep that. I wanted to point out one other thing about financing too, that Stephanie mentioned, and, and I'm certainly not trying to raise a specter here, but the notion that some of this may have to come from tax costs in the future because of the increase in costs. I point out that we've already spent $850,000. It's gonna probably be a million very shortly. Um, if we do not go forward with the project, that million is coming out of tax dollars too because there will be no other place to take it. So we'd have to float the bond we've already approved and pay for that. So, you know, we're not, it's, <laughs> It's not like, gee, if you keep going, you're going to cost a million. Well, if you stop, you're going to cost a million. So I think it's important to, to weigh those things together. I just wanted to, it hadn't been mentioned earlier, so I wanted to say that. So I'm done. Any other questions about the finances? And just to be clear, what we may be, uh, what we're considering tonight is just approving um, the design changes. Um, not necessarily um, even actually moving forward with the project in general. Um, it would be continuing the project through the litigation using this design. Um, right. Obviously, when, when we get to whenever the finality of that process is, um, then we would, you know, we won't really, like anything, you never know the actual cost until you put it out to bid. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, so we would be making decisions about that all along as you yep. know obviously the hotel project um jack did you want to um yes yes yeah. thank you um the uh the brownfield remediation costs are those higher than we uh, expected because there's more polluted uh material on the site or because you've determined there's not any uh, any other way to uh, to take care of that or uh, 
or what exactly is it? That's a good question. Um, it's it, when we first had the estimate in 2018, we had most of the characterization done, I think, at that point in time. So we knew it was very dirty dirt, um, but we didn't quite know how, what level it would rise to on DECs, the, the, the state's um, measure of how it could be disposed of, because they have specific regulations around that. And then it was a question of where. And there's lots of different, there's some options. We tried to sit, get as much on the site. If you can cap it on your own site and it's a parking structure, so it's great. Problem is we're digging, <laughs> we're going deeper. So we're actually excavating and having to get rid of material. So it was a combination of how would it be characterized by the state that we didn't know. And also we didn't know where it could go and how much that would cost. Thank you. Um, following up on this, and this might be a question more to the uh, manager than to you, but if the uh, if the project does not go forward, does the city have any uh, any source of funds to uh, do that brownfield remediation at the present time? You mean just do the brownfield remediation without doing the project? Yeah. Um, we don't really, and we, I'm not sure we would. Uh, the the bulk of it is on land that is currently owned by the Capitol Plaza that will be being transferred to the city. So it wouldn't be the city's property uh, to do it. And the remainder, in fact, I'm not sure how much there is on the Heaney lot, it's not a lot. Um, so you know, the city doesn't really own either of the pro properties at that point. Obviously, if we were to acquire the land from Capitol Plaza as per the arrangement, um, then it would be our property, we'd have to do it. And we, as part of our lease amendment with the Heenies, uh, we would take care of that there. But. And, and to your point, um, it's also, it won't be disturbed if there's no project. It's conceivably not being dug up and exposed and needing to be removed from there because it would just continue to be under the parking lot as it is today. But so that, part, that polluted soil would just stay okay. there if not for this project, which is funding to, that is funding to remove it. Correct. Correct. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, questions about the finances? Okay, so I know there are some folks from the public who would like to uh, make some uh, public or make some comments about this. Um, and I uh, had a heads up from uh, Sandy Bitstrom and Rebecca Davison that y'all were interested in making um, some comments. So we'll start uh, with you and then we'll um, uh, see if there's any other who would like to make a comment. Um, Sandy or Rebecca, would are, are you still interested in making a comment? I don't, I'm trying to, oh, there. Hi, uh, this is Sandy. Um, I am actually uh, going to speak first if I can for Bill Kuski. He had trouble with his audio, and um, I can't tell him. Sorry, it's uh, <laughs> a really weird thing. So um, he just asked me to read this out loud for him. Okay. Um, hello, I would like to speak later for myself, but this is for Yeah, Bill. that's fine. Yep. Hello, my name is Bill Kuski. I live at 5 Deerfield Drive. I'm firstly a concerned citizen and also a member of the appellant group for the proposed parking garage for the new Hampton Inn Hotel. I'm a resident of Montpelier for 25 years, raised my family here, and I'm a member of Christ Church. I have not been active in city politics until I became a member of the group on election day in 2018 when I signed a petition to challenge the $10.5 million bond to finance the construction. I was persuaded with logic that taxpayers should not take on debt. And since then, I've learned a great deal more about the genesis of the financing and the design that's raised even more concerns for me. The most tangible design concern has to do with public safety. That is both the first and the new design make no improvements to the primary access between the garage and the Capitol Plaza uh, in Christ Church. The city agrees that this is a street but it does not meet safety criteria for a street. There should be sidewalks on both sides of the street and parallel or angle parking. The proposed design is a life safety hazard and it's specifically prohibited in our zoning ordinance. I'm a member of this group without a legal mind, but I'm very proud to participate in the meetings 
and I've been impressed with our, the work of our lawyer. I do believe that we have the best interest in Montclair in mind. I'm not anti-garage, nor am I anti-merchant, nor am I against the sheriff. I just want, I want the hotel and the family to prosper. There are plenty of concerns about the project and are only highlighted in these COVID-19 times. How many businesses will reopen after this, whichever, whatever after me, after the pandemic? Will a new hotel be necessary? Will the Hampton Inn Corporation be inclined to make the investment? What are the updated construction costs? Does the Vermont General Fund have the sources for the TIF funds? Should the city voters be given a chance to vote again on the new design? Can a garage or a hotel be built with proper social distancing? How do hotels and restaurants operate moving forward? I believe these are viable questions that all Montpelier residents may have, regardless of how they feel about this project or how they voted in November of 18. And the climate has changed a great deal since then. I understand it would be very difficult for the city manager to help the project at this point because of how much investment has gone into the project. I have a very good idea at the inception of the project with some, uh, oh, it was a very good idea at the inception of the project with some flaws. Times have changed and it may be best to take a more conservative approach and pause the project. I believe if handled it properly, the city council, the mayor, and the city manager should gain the confidence of the public with caution. There's still time to do the right thing. Thank you. That's Bill. Thank you, Sandy. Um, Since you have the floor, do you want to um, make your comment? Actually, no. I'm going to turn uh, comments over to Dan Costin next, but I'd like to come back later. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, since Rebecca uh, Davison had gotten in touch um, ahead of time, do, would you like to go next, Rebecca? Um, you're on mute, Rebecca. Rebecca. Um, no, let Dan go first. Okay, that's fine. Dan, did you want to make a comment? Yes, Dan Costin, I assume you mean, right? Okay, go for it, Dan. Uh, if yeah, you would so, uh, your name uh, and, you. and also just try to keep it to two minutes or name where you live. 50 seconds, I time myself. <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, so yeah, my name is Dan Costin and I served on the uh, uh, Montpelier uh, Transportation Advisory Committee and also the Energy Advisory Committee. Uh, I'm sorry, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. And uh, during that time, uh, uh, I worked uh, to try to implement the uh, city's transportation plan, which is called Montpelier in Motion. And so uh, that plan outlines uh, the bike ped uh, network uh, plan for the city of Montpelier. And uh, uh, I also, during that time, worked on some of the uh, improvements uh, to the bike paths along, or the, uh, the bike lanes on Elm Street and Northfield Street. That were put in and, and that process that we followed at that time was uh you know when there was some new project coming up where a road need to be repaired uh the infrastructure improvements from that plan uh the transportation plan was uh you know put into effect and we added that infrastructure uh but for this project it seems like the first go around uh that wasn't really followed and that uh it was sort of done without the montpelier in motion plan in mind uh and so uh, we were left without that link. There was a link in the Montpelier in motion plan through the Heaney lot as part of the planned bike network. Uh, and, you know, it looks like that's improved with this version, uh, but it's still uh, a little bit less than what it could be. Uh, and the two major issues that I have with uh, the uh, bike path that goes through there is uh, first, uh, it's not wide enough. I don't think it's, uh, it's eight feet wide and right up against the garage and uh, B Trans has guidelines uh, that we followed for you know the uh, rec path that goes along the Winooski for a 10 foot wide path with uh, two foot wide shoulders uh, and and that doesn't seem to be uh, you know followed uh, for this one and the second is that uh, it is quite short it only goes halfway past the garage and then stops and. Uh, I really don't see any reason why uh, it couldn't be extended all the way to State Street. It would be a lot easier for uh, bicyclists uh, to find it off of State Street and actually get to the rec path along the Winooski, uh, if that were the case. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, I would just like to say that uh, we should have higher standards for 
uh, bicycle infrastructure and pedestrian infrastructure in the city. And uh, I'd like to see that changed. Thank you. Um, who would like to go next? Andrea, mm -hmm. would if I could. Uh, Andrea, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. I'm Andrea Stander. I live at 25 Liberty Street in Montpelier. I've been in Montpelier for about 23 years. Um, I want to say that I appreciate uh, the revisions to the revisions of the design that were described tonight, although, and in this case, I'm specifically referring to the return to standard parking lot or parking garage design of slope floors and so on, because I did a little looking into that because when I thought about the possibility that this building could be put to a different use in the future, that seemed like a good idea. But when I looked into it, I, I realized that, and I'm not an expert on this at all, and I did just a little bit of research, but um, the previous design would never have worked or would have been horribly expensive to turn into housing. So, um, but as I said, that was one ray of hope for me that this building could have another life in the future. Um, I won't get into that any further at the moment, um, but I have spent a good bit of time down there looking at that space after having looked at the renderings and, and so on that were provided. And I have had a very hard time trying to envision what this will look like um, in reality. And so the request that I would make is that as part of this process, as you go forward, and I'm still a little confused about when and how, for how long the public gets to comment on this redesign, um, but we really need to see renderings that show us what it looks like now and what it will look like when the project is in place. Because there's a whole lot of impacts that I can envision just from standing there staring and looking in from different angles um, and kind of estimating sizes and stuff that, that will significantly change the way the downtown looks. Um, I'm pretty sure if you're standing on Main Street um, near Shaw's, you probably will maybe be able to see the top of the Golden Dome, maybe, I'm not sure, it's hard to tell. Um, and I do worry about the impact on the church. Um, not just the possibility of them ever building housing as they had talked about, but also just the visual impact on the church. I mean, that beautiful stained glass window that's in the church will hardly ever see the sun, um, as far as I can tell, looking at the dimensions and everything. So I would really ask, and, and I hope the counselors would want to see these themselves, is and I know it costs money and all of that, but this is a huge investment and it will change the character of the city uh, forever. Um, to see some renderings of what does it look like now and what will it look like when that project is built? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who'd like to go now? Uh, go ahead, Dot. I'm You're muted, muted though. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm one of those old people. Anyway, hi, hi everybody. Um, for the record, my name is Dot Helling, 29 East State Street, and I wanted to talk a bit about parking spaces uh, because, in my opinion, the city cannot really argue in favor of this project on the grounds that increased parking will be available to serve the downtown. And I've looked at the space count and follow my numbers because in fact, I see the combined project as it's currently presented, losing, losing a total of 43 public metered spaces. Um, in 2018, before the bike path construction and the closures related to this project, there were 120 available public spaces. Um, since the plaza lot closed and the bike path opened, there appear to now be just 52 spaces and they're all in the heating lot. And there will only be 77 spaces post construction. The initial design provided for 88. Um, the project just simply does not guarantee increased public parking. 
Um, the total gain, including the car lot spaces, is only 52 and not the 160 that's been claimed. Um, the so-called flex 200 flex spaces to be used by the hotel are not readily available to the general public. We can't count on these spaces being available during our busiest days when the hotel gets them first come, first serve for their tenants, their sub lessees, their staff, their hotel guests, and conference attendees. Um, I think the city's numbers should not mix apples and oranges. To say we have available public spaces, which include what were Christchurch and Northfield Savings Bank spaces, is inaccurate. Those were not public. And the church will lose four spaces under the new plan. Um, the latest change to the plan has had an increased negative effect on the number of parking spaces available to the public. It does not add spaces to the inventory. At a minimum, it takes away 43 public spaces. At a minimum, this entire project reduces, it just does not increase the number of readily available public metered parking spaces. Um, you know, I love our merchants, I love our downtown, but losing 43 fully public parking spaces hurts them and hurts them all. Uh, we've seen the effect of losing as few as three, and we're talking about losing at least 43. So that argument just doesn't fly um, in my book unless the city can explain otherwise. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Jack. Um, who, uh, by the way, I'm sort of keeping a list of, um, you know, comments and questions people have, um, but uh, other, other folks, who um, else would like to say something? Uh, yeah, Jill, go ahead. Hi, I'm Jill Muir. I live at 234 Main Street. I've lived in Montpelier for 31 years, and I was glad to hear that finances were discussed tonight, but I'm I've been worried about them from the beginning and I still am to a high degree. Uh, city center garage downtown spends $909 per space annually. And that's an amount that the owner says is not enough. Um, there was also a 2006 study done by experts that estimated $720 per space. And that's $921 in current dollars uh, accounting for inflation. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how Montpelier can realistically say that uh, they will spend $270 per space. It, it seems way off. It's less than St. Albans cities. Um, it's also vital that this garage be built with high strength concrete that has anti-corrosion add additives and epoxy coated reinforcing. So I'm wondering if that's part of the design and if that cost has been counted for. And I really am trying to understand as a resident uh, the $93,000 annual budget. It just doesn't seem like enough um, based on St. Albans budget. Um, then even with the high strength concrete, which I hope we would use and the anti-corrosion materials, garages still need a new membrane uh, in year 20. And that cost adjusted for inflation will be about $144,000. So, we really need to put a lot of thought into this and do it carefully. I happen to work under city center garage. It's not the most pleasant thing. We have frequent loud repairs and colleagues have occasionally had to move spaces because the garage was leaking on their computer space. Um, that happened as recently as a few months ago. Um, if you park there, your car gets rusty water stains that won't come off. Um, through regular means, you have to bring it somewhere. And um, I don't think the garage actually has ever been inspected. And frankly, I'm actually nervous that it's gonna fall down and kill us off. <laughs> so um, I would like to request that the city maybe think about inspecting it. Um, so my point is that it's really crucial to be realistic about proper construction and uh, be really transparent and meticulous about all the costs and about setting aside enough money annually. And I know that's really hard for the city. There are a lot of pressures with infrastructure, uh, breaking with high health costs. Uh, climate change is going to be wreaking even more havoc in the coming years. So 
Um, I guess I just ask that we do this right if it happens and that we not kick the can down the road for future generations to bear the cost of our mistakes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, who else would like to go? Uh, go for it, Sandy. Yeah. Uh, you are still muted. There we go. There. I get to see everyone else that we can't see ourselves. So um, thank you. I think um, these previous comments all tie together about the whole picture of this garage, the initial investment, the ongoing maintenance of it, um, how does the cash flow work, uh, and then uh, the issue of major maintenance later on. Um, I want to point out that the initial uh, bond vote for 10.5 million should have contained at least a 10% contingency. I would have been shocked if it didn't because it was not based on any kind of bid. So it actually probably should have had a 15% contingency. So this increase of 1.5 million or 10%, particularly the fact that it's in soft cost, uh, other than the cost of inflation is, is, is a problem. And, and it doesn't work with the pro forma that has been laid out. Um, all of the, those were all in 2018 dollars and that whole thing needs to shift. But I hope this is an opportunity for the city team uh, to use uh, what uh, um, Jill said is meticulous process to make sure that it's comprehensive pro forma. Um, that one and a half million extra principal is going to equal more than $2 million of extra debt. Um, I want to point out that the green walls that are now back in the project have a particularly high maintenance cost. Um, I don't think that the city has included a number of things. Um, looking at St. Albans' uh, schedule of costs, um, they spend $213,000 a year, and um, we would have they, their garage is only two thirds the size of, a, of the Montpelier one. Uh, this new change of reducing the quality of construction down to steel plus concrete has definite effect on your long-term maintenance costs and the critical annual maintenance of washing down the structure, repairing small um, uh, damage before it gets larger and, and damage gets down to the reinforcing. Um, it is probably not a wise long-term investment, someone needs to do a life cycle analysis of the more expensive kind of construction versus the steel and concrete construction. Um, and also be seriously considering major maintenance around year 20. Um, the superior methods require about 150 to $200,000 a year after year 20, which is a lot of money in 10 years. It's like almost more than a million dollars itself. Uh, but this, you could be looking at one to two million dollars alone in year 20 and more replacing it. If you keep in mind, um, I worked on a state garage in Burlington and it was going to have 14 million dollars worth of repairs. Either that or keep the building closed or demolish it. It becomes a non negotiable situation when concrete is falling on cars and possibly people. Um, this also could, so as, as I want to point out, may have a shorter lifespan where you're having to look at demolition before 40 years. That should be in a life cycle cost analysis all the way back cradle to grave. Grave does not mean a uh, deteriorated structure standing on the edge of our city. It means removing it. That should be part of your life cycle cost analysis. Um, Sandy, do you have a, a bunch more? You're at a, um, almost I'm four almost minutes. Okay. I appreciate it. I had a lot and I condensed it a lot. I'm almost done. The other thing, I talked to Dan Richardson about this and he knows some of my particular concerns, but the pro forma should be con con also including rent for surface spaces at the Capitol Plaza and in the Heaney lot, as well as the revenue for those spaces. 
I want to close with a very important point, which I don't think people understood. And it took me a while to get this talking to a couple of our other residents in town who know a lot about finances. That our total grand list is now $877 million. Our total tax burden right now is $23.6 million. What that means is once the Hampton in its 6.5 comes into the, the grand list, we are only going to have a savings. So if you look at my house, which is assessed at 340,000, it's going to mean that the Hampton Inn brings me a savings in my taxes of $68 a year, $68 a year. And that is assuming that the building doesn't decrease in value in the first 20 years, which is almost impossible. So every million that the garage goes over budget out of the pro forma of a net zero, every million, I personally will be paying $387 out of my pocket. So when you go over 1.4, 1.5 million and it turns into an extra almost two and a half million dollars, that means $500 out of my pocket. There is no savings to me as a taxpayer that the Hampton Inn is added to the revenue for the city. It's really important to think about this and, and, and to understand what you are doing. This is about the biggest um, potential risk that we've been put in. We have bonded for very important things like the sewage treatment plant. And I, I just don't think this is in the same critical infrastructure category. And so it's- it Sandy, usually, you're, at about, you're at about six minutes right now. Thank you. I really appreciate you for not muting me. I just okay. wanna say it's important to be meticulous, please. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, All right, I, um, I, I'll speak now. Go, go ahead, go ahead, Rebecca. Thank you. So, um, uh, sort of building on what Sandy and others have said, um, I I think that, that we all understand that we're living in extraordinary times. That this is not this is not 2018 anymore, folks. This is really really different. Um, <clears throat> and I, it's my understanding that the hotel is a critical financial viability for the parking lot. Correct. The, the hotel has to be built with a parking lot, um, yeah. parking garage. Um, but my question is, what is the status of the hotel project, both the new hotel and the boutique upgrade? The Hilton Corporation um, stock is down 40%. Um, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, the company issued a press release on March 26th it said, quote, with travel at a virtual standstill, operations have been suspended across many managed and franchised hotels. The, <clears throat> the president and CEO is foregoing a salary for the rest of 2020. The top executives have taken a 50% 50 pay, uh, 50 pay cut, and the company is eliminating non-essential expenses, including capital expenditures. So my question is, is this really, is this hotel really going to be built? Are we really going to have enough visitors to warrant a parking garage? Um, the other thing about in terms of parking, um, what is and what will be the need for parking downtown is really, really in question. Unofficial estimates um, from the state are saying that 90% of the state workers are going to be working from home for the foreseeable future. According to one staffer at VTrans, they're expecting to work from home two to three days a week after the, pan after the pandemic. Um, and in fact, in, in, in uh, Governor Scott's news um, uh, press conference today, his spokesperson said that people are going to be working for home for at home for a long time. So I don't know where the revenue is going to come for this to pay, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be the taxpayers that are going to be paying it. Um, 
So what is the city's plan for anticipated losses in property tax revenue? You know, nearly one third of Americans didn't pay April rent or mortgage. What are, what are the current, what's going on with the current landlords today? Any unemployment rate, when the unemployment rate skyrockets, which it is now, how long will the landlords and banks carry these loans? What is the city plan for the significant budget shortfalls through <clears throat> lost revenue that the sales tax, rest, restaurant closings, and tourism losses? Is the Capitol Plaza going to be able to make its tax payment? And Rebecca, you have about, about three minutes. Okay, I have one sentence. With the city and the state facing masses expenditures and the monumental critical public health care needs we're facing during the COVID-19 crisis, can we honestly think that expending money on a parking garage is the right thing to do? Thank you. Um, all right, anybody else want to speak? Nat is speaking. Nat's rubbing in. Um, I live, at, I live at Southern Hillside Avenue. Um, I did a little math and I think I lived in the city for at least 45 years. We're tied. I live here 50. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, thanks for this opportunity to address the council. We've heard a lot of specific comments this evening about design specifications and costs of the proposed Montpelier garage. And it's increasingly hard for me to see how this garage can be built and paid for. But let's not quit on talking together and thinking critically. But before I want to discuss the proposed garage, I want to acknowledge some very positive things that are happening in Montpelier. Um, Nat, if you would try to, hey, Nat, if you would try to keep your comments specific to the topic at hand, that would be helpful. He is writing this, and he's, it is it is relevant. Just keep it keep it to this topic. Thanks. Um, Please don't interrupt him. All right, keep us on topic here, okay? Thank you. Go ahead, Nat. Speaking about historic preservation, ten or so years ago. With the founding of the Ramon College of France, the new college saved the College Hall and the college campus, a terrific achievement. I'm talking about positives. The steady growth of the Montpelier Farmers Market as a source of locally grown fresh food and a community meeting place is another positive. Then this past year, the renovation of the Main Street French Block opposite City Hall really transformed what looked like an abandoned downtown block and turned it into a place for people to live and live downtown. Then this year, we celebrated construction of a new transit center. That center gives a whole new first impression for visitors entering capital city. Overlooks a new bike path and affirms the logic and necessity of transportation alternatives, not just cars, but people walking, bike riding, taking a bus or a train. I worry about the proposed new garage for these reasons. First, it's in the wrong location because it blocks a view from one direction of the remote state house and blocks an access to the North Branch River from the other direction. Second, the new garage, if built, will cause a downtown traffic quagmire. Imagine in a car entering the city across the Taylor Street Bridge and quickly encountering the failed intersection at Taylor and State. And after a right-hand turn onto State Street, there's another failed intersection at State and Elm. You're still driving, but you're not yet at the garage and you're still not parked in the structure. Third, we've got to see our rivers as a valuable natural resource. Let's not hide the North Branch behind an oversized garage. For years, we have imagined 
creating a walking path from the confluence of the North Branch and Winooski Rivers, north to State Street, then to Langdon Street, then to School Street, all the way to Lane Shops, and finally to the Montpelier Rec Field. Montpelier deserves our care and affection. Let the center of town be a place to walk, shop, dine, meet friends. Let Montpelier breathe instead of filling our streets with traffic, pollution, and congestion. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And I would uh, remind folks to try to be respectful of how we run our meetings. And that means that I do get to interrupt people um, when it's appropriate. Uh, so, um, anyone else have something they would like to add? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, Bill, did, uh, there were a number of issues uh, raised. Do you want to address any of the concerns that were brought up? All right. Um, I think we can address a lot of them. If possible, uh, many of them, not all of them, but many of them related to the litigation, pending litigation. I. I guess I wonder if we can't spend a couple of minutes with our attorney and executive session and figure out which ones we can answer now and which ones we can't um, or shouldn't. And uh, because so, some are general statements that I think are easily answered and some are very specific, you know, are issues in discovery and are pending them. So I, that would be my suggestion before I just start answering. Okay. I think that makes sense. Um, so your recommendation would be that we go into executive session? Uh, yeah, I don't think it's going to be super long, but we've got Dave's here. Um, I would need to be sent the link, please. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> Stephanie, too, I think. We want to include Stephanie, yes. Cameron, can you send David and Stephanie the link? Thank you. Um, Donna, it looked like uh, Donna and then Jack. Well, mine is more procedural, uh, Mayor, and that is I'm just looking at a break. Do we get a break before executive session or right after so people understand when we're coming right back? That's a great point. Maybe um, we can uh, vote to go into executive session and then um, talk about what we need to talk about there and then take a break before we come back. Does that sound okay? Thank you. Yeah, great. Question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jack. Yes, pursuant to 1 VSA section 313 A1E. I move that we go into executive session to discuss a matter in litigation. Second. Okay, so there's uh, been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, can I just okay. make one? Oh, yeah, go I'm, ahead, Dan. I'm not opposed, but I, I'd just like to make one clarification that we're going into executive session to discuss a legal matter, receive legal advice. The um, premature discussion in public of which would cause prejudice to one or more parties because I think that's a required finding under the statute. Do we need, I think we, this is maybe one of those things where we have to have two votes? Yes, we need, need to make, have a motion to make that finding first. Okay, let's, yeah. let's do that. <laughs> Let me, um, I'll make the motion um, that the premature, uh, that the we need to seek legal uh, counsel at this at this point in time, and that the premature public discussion of said legal advice in the public uh, forum would cause prejudice to one or more parties. Second. Any further discussion. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, so now, as uh, Bill, did you have a point? If you, when you move to go to an executive session, will you please move to include David Adu, Stephanie Clark, and Greg Rabideau, as well as me, but I think you've already included me anyway. So now I'll move to go into executive session on the ground stated before and to include David Rue, uh, Greg Rabideau, and Stephanie Clark. Clark. And, and, and Cameron, manager. that means Greg's gonna need the link too. Great. You're the best. Okay. Any further discussion? 
Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Did somebody second it this time around? I can second it. Aye. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay, one more time. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Great. Uh, opposed? Second. <laughs> okay, um, we will be right back from our um, executive session. For the discussion, uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so we are back. And um, so I, I just want to um, thank all of you who uh, made comments uh, about uh, about the garage. And I just want you to know we're going to take those um, comments under advisement. Um, that's, that's all I've got to say for now. Is there a motion? I'll, I'll move that the city council accept the uh, revised garage design as proposed. I'll second. We have multiple seconds. Uh, okay, any further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please. Oh, uh, Jack, go ahead. I, I just want to comment that uh, as we've gone through this whole uh, process and it's over, it's about a year and a half since the uh, voters uh, voted to approve this, uh, people have continued to come to council and um, advocate for improvements in, uh, in the design and improvements in uh, how, how the design uh, parking structure would fit in with uh, the city. And I think that that advocacy has been effective because over that time we have made significant changes to the design that has those changes have made the design better than uh, it was when we started out. And so I appreciate the uh, the public participation, but I also want to emphasize how responsive, in my view, the city has been to uh, the concerns of the uh, community. Okay, thank you. Any further comments? Okay, there's been a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, Thank you all. And um, we actually did not take our break while we were in executive session. Um, yeah, so uh, David, was that that was you waving goodbye, David? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, so on um, by Stephanie, thank you. thank you. And Greg, um, so uh, we are gonna take a break right now. Um, let's reconvene at 8.50, six whole minutes. Okay. We do have a quorum. We could move forward. <laughs> we'll give, uh, oh, Donna's here. Donna's back. Awesome. Dan. And we, and we have Dan. Great. Well, we're all here. So uh, we're going to come back from break. Thanks for being so prompt, everybody. That was great. Uh, all right. So we had moved some items around. Um, and the the next one was uh, the the down home parklet uh, reuse. Um, we had moved that forward, and I, I'm glad that we did. Um, so I think it's still timely here. Um, and I know so Tom Glock is here. Um, Fred Bashera. Uh, so. Uh, either Bill or Tom, uh, who would like to explain this situation? Um, I can, Anne, if you want to, want me to, okay, or Bill, if you want to. Um, well, Jay Morgans has been offered the opportunity from the down home owners uh, to purchase their uh, parklet and to potentially move it in front of the Capitol Plaza um, for this summer. Um, with the opening or potential reopening from the governor of a restaurant space, it's going to be significantly limited at, to start. So we were interested in it. And so we figured we'd uh, 
we'd hear it out and see if it was a possibility from the city um, to move, but basically just take the same one that was on Langdon Street and move it in front of Jay Morgan's, um, where it is right now, at least for this summer. Um, it would occupy, I thought it was only two spots, but it looks on the agenda, it says three. Um, it would occupy the spots uh, right next to the outdoor seating that they already have out there right now. And it would allow for uh, more access to uh, um, outside seating for this summer um, for uh, Jay Morgan's. So we got this request from Capitol Plaza, from Jay Morgan's uh, for this. And, you know, we spent all our time on the park that ordinance. This is one contingency we never really thought about. Um, you know, we approved the, the, the parklet for three years for down home in that specific location. And I, I think, you know, the, if I think the question is if somebody had come into that down home location and wanted to take it over for the remaining year or whatever, that's one, there wouldn't have been any question like yeah different owner but same location same but here we you know someone wants to move it now, i don't think you philosophically i don't think we from the city have any issue with that we haven't done the kind of vetting and review that we normally do there's usually a little traffic safety thing that goes to just make sure where the location is going to be and all that stuff as you know you get that from the police and fire which we'd be happy to do for this location but my first reaction was, I, you know, is this what the council intends uh, to do? It's not really spoken about. Is this, can people sort of, or would this be a new application? How, you know, how, how do you want to handle this? So I, like I said, we don't, I don't have any particular philosophical concerns about it um, other than we would want to do the, the safety vetting. Um, but it's really, your interpretation of how you want to handle the ordinance and if we want to change that in the future. And related to that, we, and I don't, I don't, I hope we can take these separately so we don't hold up the Capitol Plaza folks. But we also got a, a request for a food, uh, a food truck, not just one of our little vendors. And again, COVID related, I mean, they make smoothies and things. And that's not really a, a meal thing, but they wanted to use a parking space for the summer. Now we do have one more parking space in the parklet ordinance, but it wouldn't be a parklet, it would be a food truck. Um, but this is a person who normally makes their living going to festivals all around Vermont all summer and they're all canceled. So they're like, look, can we park somewhere and try to do it this way? So again, I'd separate those, but it's, uh, you know, I think we've got some unusual things. I'll shut up and let you guys have at it. Sorry, one, one clarifying um, point about that. Um, Bill, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, food truck issue is, um, might actually be, that some there might be some kind of problem with food trucks in another part of our ordinances. Is that is that also your understanding? Well, um, there's, we have a vendor ordinance. So, and it was really intended for the vending carts. Mm -hmm. and it, that vending ordinance specifically says you can't use a parking space. Right. Where's the food so, <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure that that part was was out there. Um, even though I think I agree, we should take these um, separately. Uh, Jack, you had some um, potential language, yeah. I did, and uh, thank you. I, I spent a little time uh, researching our parklet ordinance uh, since this came on our. I think I understand. And. Um, Okay, to keep going? Yes, go ahead, yes. And uh, at that time, I did not realize that there was an agreement or a potential agreement to transfer the parklet. And there actually is a one line in the, uh, in the ordinance about transferring parklet, parklets, which says the interest, applicant's interest in the agreement under set, section seven is not assignable without the prior consent of the city. So that seems to be a negative pregnant, and it seems to be saying that, in fact, it can be assigned with the uh, approval of the city. Um, now, the, the right uh, that Down Home Restaurant has in this parklet is for one, one year left of a three-year agreement and three spaces, and the ordinance has been amended to say two spaces so that uh, when the, when the this part of the permit expires, the next year it would only be uh, eligible for two spaces, not three. But uh, 
I think it would be great. I think that all the, all the good things about uh, parklets and why we like them are, are carried out in uh, allowing this to be transferred and moved to a different location. Um, I, I agree. I think it, so at one point I had thought that maybe we should um, take the time to let other potentially interested parties also weigh in, but um, I, I think it probably makes the most sense now to just, uh, if we if we can, if it's the will of the council, to, as you're suggesting, Jack, um, just make the um, reassignment of this parklet for one year pending um, you know, the safety approval uh, and then revisit the ordinance language uh, to potentially address you know, the, the suggestions that you have or if we think that it's fine with this one line, it seems like it could probably be clearer. Um, also add into that any refinements regarding food trucks um, and as well as, um, I actually have some other thoughts about um, uh, whether whether retail stores wanted to um, access parklets for additional like open air sales. Um, I, I mean, I, I would like to make that available to retail folks if that's of interest. So those are all separate things from the question at hand, um, which I feel comfortable, I, I'll speak, speak for myself, I feel comfortable um, just, you know, doing that today. Um, Donna. Well, it's, I'm not sure why, Tom, you chose to re take over down home because the parklet has two functions. One is the space, which down home had next to their place. And then it's what they constructed in it that they're actually wanting to use over on State Street. So I see it as a new application that just happens to be using the furnishings of a park that we're familiar with. And that would give them three years if we were to approve it. So I would think you'd be better off just saying this is a new application, great, and that you're reusing a parklet, so we're familiar with what it looks like, and move on it. Tom, do you have a preference there? Do you, I mean, well, the, uh, three, the three years would be better, obviously, because we could, you know, um, you know, we were approached, so we didn't, you know, this was an option that they approached us. We haven't purchased it yet, pending city approval. So if it doesn't happen, we we probably won't do it. Um, we would uh, obviously appreciate three years versus one year because it would give us a chance to. I don't know, you know, obviously this year is the most important because we have limited ability to p keep people inside, and and I know the governor's proposal is probably opening up with 25% capacity to start, which is gonna be very difficult for anyone um, to, to, to start with. So I would suggest Donna's suggestion of three years would be what we would, what we would uh, uh, significantly uh, appreciate. Uh, Jack. We've got a difficulty with that because the application period is from November 1st to February 1st. So I know, but in these times, give me a break. <laughs> I know, November 1st to February, but we weren't doing them then, were we? <laughs> well, we, uh, Down Home was, was closed during uh, two thirds of that period, so. It's kind well, of but if, if somebody were applying for Down Home's actual location, then that would really affect it. But right now I see it as just parklet space that they're requesting that they're going to reuse the material from another space. Yeah. I think the only issue, and again, I'm, I'd be happy if they got three years, it'd be fine. The issue that Jack referenced is I think we changed the ordinance to say that they could, they, they could only be two spaces. So if this was a new application for three spaces for three years, we may not be able to approve it. Whereas we can transfer an existing one year and then figure out when we're doing drafting, maybe we'll go back to allowing three spaces or grandfathering three spaces or, you know, however we want to deal with that. But uh, that would be the um, one. Could we not make it an exception because they are reusing something that we feel that is a good parklet? I, 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 it makes sense to me that we would um, at least grandfather in that sort of, um, you know, the three space structure, but that's all part of the conversation for um, the revision of the ordinance. Um, the, other, the other issue, and again, and I'm just saying this to everyone <laughs> honest, 
is if if we were going to do this as a new application, then it should be on an agenda to give abutters and everybody the chance to weigh in on it. If it's an extension of one year being moved, we can say, well, if we're going to do that. And if you they want to re-up it, then they've got to go through the full application process and people can come in and all that because you can be sure that we'll hear about three parking spaces on State Street, although maybe not this summer, but we will. <laughs> yeah. Well, so go ahead, Donna. So if indeed you're saying we do the one year and then next year you can come back and do the new application and we will have amended this to be more flexible. Potentially. Is that correct, Bill? Okay. That's what I heard others, uh, yep. I heard her honor say. Uh, hopefully, so, really the will of the council. Are you ready for a motion uh, about this uh, about this specific parklet? Yes. I mean, unless other. I'm sorry. Before we do that, any other thoughts? Anybody else want to weigh in on this? No. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Donna. Uh, I'll make a motion that we approve the parklet uh, from down home on Langley Street to be moved to State Street in front of Capitol Plaza to be used for Jay Morgan for the okay. final remaining term of a year. And Lauren, that was a second from you? <laughs> okay, great. Um, uh, uh, Dan and then Jack. Sure, could I offer a friendly amendment that that, uh, that motion be subject to a safety review um, as proposed by the city manager? Okay. <laughs> and Lauren too. <laughs> right, okay, great. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Jack. That was what I was going to say too. Okay, perfect. Further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you, and thanks, Tom. Thanks for uh, bringing this to us, and uh, good luck with it. Oh, thanks a lot. Take thank care, everyone. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> see you. Fred Senior, um, thank you too. Oh yes, thank you. <laughs> I stayed awake all this time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you stuck through the previous topic. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Um, all right. So uh, as long as we're talking about this, um, I don't know that we need a motion. Exact. Well, do we need a motion. We probably don't. Um, how, Bill, how do you, well, Bill, do you feel like you have uh, clarity about like if we were going to revise this ordinance right now, do you know um, sort of how, how do you feel like, you know, do you feel like you have good enough direction about how to revise it yet? Not really, but I also don't think we need to do it right now because there's, there's six spaces. This is three, positive pi is two. Um, so we'd maybe, you know, if anything, we'd take a look at the food truck aspect. And as long as we get it done by November or the next season, you know. Well, I'm, I, I mean, if there's this lady who's hoping, hoping to have a food truck this summer, it seems so guess, like it would. So I guess the question is maybe begin, you know, with the end in mind, right? What do, do people, are people generally favorable to that or not? If they are, then we can figure out how to propose an amendment or whatever, what needs to happen to make that happen. If, if people feel like we don't want food trucks taking up parking spaces, then we, you know, I, I think it's, what's the policy we're trying to get at? And then we yeah. can draft. Um, Lauren, then Connor. Um, I would just um, offer, I mean, I think it came up a little bit before, but just having more options for outdoor opportunities and seating. I mean, this entire summer is going to be so challenging for our restaurants, for our businesses. So, and, you know, for people who want to come enjoy our downtown. So having options and opportunities, including parklets, including, I mean, certainly we could get some input from the existing restaurants that are already going to be struggling like that. I think that yeah. dynamic is worth thinking through um, for the food truck specifically. Um, but I think, outdoor spaces in general, um, you know, you know, more picnic benches, maybe like more opportunities, <laughs> like how are we getting places where people can sit and get, get food and take it outside or, or other things to enjoy so that we can encourage folks to be eating in our great restaurants. Um, so I, I think like that, that approach and, and what policies can help support that for, for this year and whether or not that's a long-term, um, 
for everything, or at least just to get us through this really challenging time. Uh, Connor. I, I, I mean, I, I was going to say essentially the same thing. I think the ordinance as written is pretty sound, um, but pretty exceptional times here. And we just, when you say like uh, maybe retail wants to get out on the street, um, that seems like a wise way to like carry forward. So I'd love to pass something that at least gives us some flexibility to maybe have more parklets, um, you know, maybe relieve some of the restrictions just in the meantime there. I, th I think it's worth having a think anyways. When I, we I agree. I uh, sorry, go, uh, uh, go ahead, Bill, and then Donna. Nope. Okay, go ahead, Donna. Well, I was just gonna support, Lauren made a suggestion about just even having picnic tables in some parking spaces for the summer. That again, encouraging people to have a space to sit, whether it's right in front of an eatery or retail, it just gives them a gathering space um, this summer. And if we had picnic tables in our network of city equipment that we could possibly bring down to the city streets and, and look at that. As well as some suggestions we've had for the summer of turning a lot more parking spaces into other things. And whether that's some one way street or closing Langdon, but giving ways that we can be together and still have our distance that we need. So I'll just say, um, I, Mayor and I talked about this a little bit this week about you know some of these requests we're getting in it. It might make sense to, to think about these comprehensively and maybe make a sort of an emergency ordinance effective only for 2020 for now and then see, you know, see how some of these things work. And if we like the ideas, we can continue them, but really, you know, just say, hey, we're going to bend the rules because we think we will have less parking, less traffic need this year than other years. Um, I will say there's bending the rules and then there's safety. And... I know that the, the transportation people have great concern with people sitting in parking spaces next to a travel way without proper protection. And the, the parklets that we have have been specifically constructed, you know, they've been built to, they've got the sort of crash bar in them and they've got, you know, obviously they're at high speed, they're not gonna protect somebody, but at sort of low speeds along our street, if a car bumps into them, they're protection for people that are sitting there. A picnic table doesn't do that, or even a retail space. So I think we, we can we should be thinking about ways we can we can do this. But just you know, there's there's doing. I think we should be as exceptional as we can be for our, our merchants. At the same time, not putting somebody in harm's way. Agreed. Uh, uh, Jack, go ahead. I I think it's a, a bigger discussion. I think that. We're, we're, I don't think we're close to being in a position to give, tell Bill, here are your marching orders, here's what you should write up. Um, then I'm happy to ha have that bigger discussion, probably not tonight, um, since some of these other proposals I never even heard about before, uh, before tonight. But, and we should hear maybe. from the themselves what they want. And what we'll yeah. Um, maybe this is uh, something that we can put on the agenda for next time, um, if it's not already too full. It's fine with me, yeah. Okay. Um, and so I, I guess when I say put this on the agenda, what I mean there is um, exploration of some kind of emergency 2020 um, ordinance changes. Um, and maybe we could uh, purposefully invite Montpelier Live or um, the MDC to participate in what they're hearing as needs or wants from uh, the community, from the downtown businesses, and um, go from there. Um, Jay, did you have something? Oh, just that you read my mind, and I think that would, it would make absolute sense to have Montpelier Live because they're so in touch with with uh, so many with uh, city businesses, uh, you know, be the aggregate and put together some proposals that we could consider. Whether it's we could decide how far along we want those proposals to be. It could be that they were just ideas or very specific proposals. But either way, I think that they would be the perfect conduits to gather all those ideas from from merchants. Yeah. Especially if we were able to ahead of time say, here are some things that we're thinking about. Like giving people something to respond to is um, sometimes a good way to uh, get people to, you know, generate ideas 
um, even themselves. So, uh, okay. Any other, anything else on this topic? Okay. So I just want to um, uh, check in about the five home farm way um, topic. I am, uh, if it's, I, Alec has been on the line here this whole time, and I know this is probably what he wanted to talk about. I, like, unless there's um, urgency for this tonight, I would, um, I don't know, how do, how do we feel about putting that one off? Do you, it, that because this one feels like it's not going to be a short conversation. And yeah, just, go ahead, Donna. Uh, not only that, but I couldn't get the document open. I don't know if anyone else had trouble with it, but Interesting. maybe they can be resent. I, I don't know why. I've tried several different devices and I can't get it open. The document from Jamie, Duggan? The, well, the one that's attached to the agenda. Is there a separate one that I should be looking that's for? A separate document. Okay. But I think Jack, I should put it off and do it, it justice. Um, Thank and you. Jack, do you have um, anything further? Yeah, I was just going to say it doesn't require us to act tonight. So yeah. I think we can take some time. Okay. And my um, Lauren, yeah. Well, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, I know um, Alec had sent some good kind of food for thought for all of us. I don't know, since he's on the line, if there's anything that would be like, thoughts to to just um, flesh out a little bit what what he shared with us so that we could kind of think about that before the next meeting he, I, no need out <laughs> but if you stayed on all this time if there was any framing you wanted us to kind of consider for next time oh here's alec yeah yeah so knowing that we're not going to have a full discussion tonight, but you know, you can frame it up for us. I wouldn't say I have anything monumental to add um, other than what I sent. Uh, so it's a nice suggestion. I wish I had more to offer, but I think it's, it's going to be more of a discussion um, for you all. Um, you know, the, the balls in your court, as far as I could see it. Um, and I think, DHCB is looking for guidance from from city council, um, you know, in addition to the parks and, and everybody else. So, uh, boy, good luck. Um, it's a very complicated scenario, and I think there's a lot of unanswered questions, and um, yeah. I think you're wise to put it off, and it, maybe it'll give folks to, a chance to really um, do a deep dive on what's involved here, uh, if you haven't already. It's, yeah. One. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and we'll take, let's, you know, plan on taking this up next time. Um, okay. All right. So moving on to, um, we, we're not doing chapter three. So the coronavirus uh, and related issues update. Um, and I know uh, also Dan Jones has been hanging out on the line here. Um, thank you, Dan, for doing that. I assume we're gonna start with uh, Cameron and then we'll shift to Dan. All right, um, so I did send out um, a memo uh, earlier today. I just wanted to walk through that um, so that uh, the greater um, community can hear sort of our updates. Um, I just sort of wanna put out a disclaimer as um, the weather is getting warmer and we're all wanting to go outside more. I really do want us to urge folks to remember that the coronavirus is still a very present health threat. Um, the state is slowly starting its phase reopening, but that isn't the time to let up on any of our mitigation strategies. Folks really do need to continue to practice physical distancing from each other, wear masks when you're outside around other people, and to choose activities that keep you away from others. Um, we're doing really well in Vermont because we're doing really well at those mitigation strategies. So I do want to put that message out there. Um, there's quite a few state updates since last time we spoke. Um, Governor Scott on April 24th added addendum 11 to his executive order that started um, sort of directing folks to start opening again. Um, it also required um, all of our employers who have been open or are starting to reopen to uh, give their employees a VOSHA training 
which the city of Montpelier staff has completed. Um, on May 4th, Governor Scott amended addendum three of his executive order, allowing healthcare providers to provide to begin to provide non-essential outpatient clinic visits. So um, the, that amendment details the specific measures that are required for those folks to open, if you would like details there. On May 1st, he uh, issued addendum 12, um, requiring that traveling and commuting public should wear face coverings over their nose and mouth when they're using public transportation. That includes buses and a ride service. On May 6th, he issued addendum 13, where he stated that the stay home, stay safe order remains in effect, but um, he does allow now gatherings of 10 or fewer. And uh, that was sort of related to outdoor activities, um, making sure that Vermonters have the option to go outside um, and for, um, uh, have activities that are um, low or no direct contact with 10 and fewer. I'm sorry, my lights just went out. Okay. Um, he also stated that you could have inter-household socializing where members of one household may gather and allow children to play with members of another trusted household, provided safety and health precautions were allowed and followed. Addendum 13 also um, authorized government entities to offer outdoor recreation activities. On May 8th, the governor held a press conference that highlighted that child care programs can open by June 1st at their discretion and that summer camps will um, are, be, are going to be expected to be able to open under their own discretion, but they have not issued the guidelines at this time that I have seen. They might have come out while we're sitting here. I do not know. But he said that he would have guidelines for opening camps by the end of the week. We're going to need to see if we have the fiscal ability and the health and safety requirements that we're going to need to open our summer programming. So no determination on our summer programming has been met at this time. Um, the governor also stated that the school system should expect to remain virtual to the end of the school year, that graduations will not be allowed, and they are making plans to have school resume in person in the fall. I recommend that people look for further specifics for that from the Montpelier Roxbury public school system. And then today, the governor held a press conference that highlighted his potential extension of our state of emergency um, that announcement will be made on Friday, May 15th. He also emphasized the importance of wearing masks in public and maintaining six feet of physical distancing between folks. He did say that he is not interested in coming up with a mandate to wear masks and would prefer people voluntarily comply. So in general, our city updates is that we did comply with Addendum 11. All working city staff has taken the mandatory BOSHA training on health and safety requirements. Um, in a response to uh, the governor's addendum 12, the city is beginning to build out its phased approach to reopening. So the city is working on our phase one reopening plan, which will be shared for your approval at the May 27th regular council meeting. So we're currently working on that and what that looks like and what our timeline is. And we hope to have that to you by or before next, next council meeting. Um, our DPW teams want to remind residents that you might not see as many crews working on street projects out and about that you normally would. Um, as most of our crew went on voluntary furlough to help the city through the COVID-19 financial crisis that um, it's triggered. And so they're working as hard as they can with a reduced capacity. Um, so they just ask for your understanding and patience. Also, I don't know if I announced this, but the Vermont Mountaineers have let us know that they've canceled their 2020 season out of an abundance of caution. Um, so if you did sign up for summer ball, you can get a refund by contacting Brian Gallagher at 802-272-8728. So again, as you know, we're, having, we're maintaining a list of situational updates on our website. Um, there has been a change in some of our regional aid groups. Um, Wanafrock call line is now being staffed and managed by Capstone Community Action as Wanafrock is slowly um, uh, stepping back from being fully operational. So that call line is still open though. Um, the Capital Area Neighborhoods does have an email and a phone number that you can find on our website. And the Montpelier Mutual Aid Group is tracking open meal sites and their locations. And that is being shared on a few billboards around town as well that they've been putting up. I think I saw one in front of um, 
Uh, I don't remember what church that I'm talking about anymore, so I'm just going to move on. Um, so uh, some updates to our programming is that the Montpelier Senior Activity Center Feast to Go program has implemented a no mask, no food policy. So they're handing out masks to folks and making sure that people have masks, but they're not going to interact with folks without a mask. Um, as far as our recreation and park facilities updates, um, the city tennis courts are now open, all of them, and our basketball courts will be set up for use after Memorial Day. Throughout this, all city parks have remained open. However, park shelters, the pool pavilion, the courts and the skate park are used at your own risk and are subject to the governor's safety measures. So we ask that groups remain 10 or less, folks keep six feet of distance, and please wear masks if you are able. I'll just just turn it for a second. Yes. You know what I'm gonna say. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so the tennis courts are open because the police chief and the assistant city manager put up all the nets themselves, the two of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> because the rec, all the rec folks were on furlough and um, the rec director had to leave the state for a family funeral and now has to quarantine for two weeks. So. The show must go on. The show must go on. So thank you, Tony, and thank you, Cameron. <laughs> thank you for doing that. Yeah. I learned a new skill and it was very, it's gonna be useful to me. When did, when did that happen? Yesterday. Wow, okay, cool. I'm making an update tomorrow. This is, <laughs> this is big news. This is big news. I think um, the bigger question is, at what point do we not call them tennis courts, but we just call them pickleball courts? Also a good mm -hmm. question. Because that's pretty much all I ever see happening over there. It's a very sensitive subject. <laughs> from, uh, from constituent correspondence, very sensitive. Tennis, uh, pickle, no, okay. Sorry. <laughs> It's okay. Go, um, go <laughs> um, we do just want to let folks know that because of our budget constraints and because of our um, lack of staff, uh, we're unable to maintain the fields. So um, there's going to be no field rentals or outdoor facility or shelter rentals um, through at least July 1st, 2020. So we'll share updates as that as things come on board. Um, but right now we've opened all of our sort of interactive outdoor facilities, but our fields and our rentals are currently still down. Um, so uh, on sort of your feedback, we've been really ramping up our social media posts about COVID-19. And um, I won't go into too many details, but on average, we've really been receiving a lot of interactions on that social media, our social media. Um, quite a few of our posts are now getting over a thousand interactions, which is really great for our social media. So. We're trying to track um, how our metrics are doing with our posts and we're doing really great um, and we're reaching a lot more folks than we normally do. Um, I also wanted to add a section um, on Montpelier Alive. Um, they are currently strategizing on their reopening tactics. They're helping local community businesses figure out how they want to open and what their plans are um, sort of in light of the governor's orders. So um, they ask for sort of patience while they're working that out, but any updates for businesses can be found at MontpelierAlive.org. And then they did partner with the Center for Women and Enterprise and have hired a, um, I should also say they've also partnered with the MDC to hire Jean Kissner as Montpelier's recovery navigator. So she can help businesses figure out their reopening plans and help them figure out the money situation um, that they might be in. She can be reached at Jean, which is G or J E A N at excellence in OPS.com. So I just wanted to announce that publicly. So I want to sort of turn it over to um, Dan, who's been super patient and great in this meeting. Um, he has a capital area neighborhood project update for you, which I think is very exciting. So thank you. Thank you. And uh... Go for it, Dan. Thank you again for your patience. Hi. Um, well, basically, the uh, you know like we sent out the whole thing. What I'm kind of proud to say is that we've had almost 35 people step up to be uh, neighborhood coordinators uh, and volunteer on the uh, this and. Um, which is actually more than the um, MMA has actually turned up as people who needing uh, help specifically so far. There are people are informationally interested, but the, there hasn't been the demand we thought 
in terms of the actual services. What we have, what we're beginning to find now is actually people wondering about uh, more economic issues uh, that the, um, you know, the lack of work and stuff is uh, showing uh, sort of anecdotally that people are becoming increasingly worried. So this is an area that we'd like to be able to uh, bring up a little bit more. Um, the one of the things that we've, uh, you know, I stuck a bit in the report. I've talked, tried to talk to Anne about, et cetera, but um, a number of the neighborhoods are discovering there are parts of the neighborhood that are easy uh, to identify with. They kind of know each other. They've got uh, email addresses and things like that. And then there are the rental areas, uh, like along Elm Street, along uh, Berry Street, et cetera, which are a little harder to actually uh, get in touch with folks without uh, some more uh, uh, direct manner. And uh, we've had a request from people that uh, the suggestion a request that maybe we could have some um, sandwich boards that would give information on how to get in touch with the, lo the local uh, coordinators in the neighborhood so that people know, you know where to find help, et cetera. Um, this, this is going to require some printing and stuff that sort of goes beyond what we can uh, have done at the uh, senior centers. So I'm kind of putting a push in or a pitch in for a little bit of support in that regard through the city printing budget if, that, if there's any available. Um, the, uh, because the knock rock thing is being uh, cut back as a, uh, you know, there, it's just basically now down to uh, capstone. Uh, the traditional mechanisms where we've been trying to stay in touch with the various parties who are providing services is now coming much more down into basic uh, things of, uh, you know, like the feast program at the senior center, uh, like I said, uh, access to food. And that food issue has been what uh, we're finding uh, interesting. There's been some discussion about uh, with people, and we've helped uh, initiate this to some degree, but the idea of being able to figure out what is our food security issues in Montpelier. Uh, if you've gone into the Shaw's recently, et cetera, you're noticing that the meat counters are getting uh, less product, uh, that there's more empty spaces on the shelves and stuff, and that's beginning to translate into what people are seeing. So we're looking at uh, trying to figure out how do we begin to attend to Montpelier's food security as part of uh, this effort of, uh, you know, is there a way of being able to recognize what people are in need, what they need, et cetera? Are there ways of using public spaces uh, for community gardens, et cetera, to increase our local food security? And I want to bring that back to you if you allow me uh, in the future. We're exploring it right now, but we will be having tomorrow night. And um, I've asked if, if you don't uh, complain to ask Jay Erickson if he would be uh, sort of the council representative for a. Um, Montpelier uh, Area Food Security uh, Coalition, which will bring in, P, uh, you know, the food pantries. It'll bring in the farmers market. It'll bring in um, the uh, various organizers within uh, a number of these issues to try and talk about, you know, how do we ensure that there is a steady uh, food supply if there is a, a disruption uh, coming in the uh, the coming months, and so wanted to inform you of that. We'll uh, be able to report to you on it later, but it is a sort of an outgrowth of the CAN effort. And uh, for that, I'll uh, open any questions if you have them. Any questions for Dan? Nope. Uh, no, ahead, I, Dan. Sorry. Um, Dan, we had talked earlier in the week um, about the idea of whether or not some city services um, could be used to help citizens who are looking to uh, develop their gardens. Is that is that something you're ready to sort of discuss tonight, or is that? Well, I've I've been kind of informed that uh, there is no resources for that, so that's why you know I'm I'm uh, hesitant to try and ask for what there isn't. Uh, um, you know, I know having talked to Alec Ellsworth, et cetera, that uh, he says, well, this is stuff they would like to help with because uh, he's a strong believer in the, uh, the public garden thing. And I would, you know, it's the kind of thing I would hope that the council would be open to considering, like I said, if the food security issue is becoming, uh, you know, more recognized. Uh, 
and the food security, remember, is not just a question of the availability of the food, but it's also the cost of it. And what, they're, what we're finding in public information is that the uh, mm -hmm. inflation across the board in the country is going down, except for food, which is going up rather rapidly. So we have to worry about all those out-of-work out of folks who uh, may be having uh, affordability issues in the future. So I, that's a long-winded answer, Dan, of saying that uh, we would love to be able to ask for it, but I would love the council's guidance on how we could. So I'll I mean, jump in here and say that I, I'm going to plead guilty here and say that I, I really um, could when So Dan and I talked earlier today and I was very hesitant about whether or not we would have the capacity to um, to help out with the, with uh, private gardening uh, type efforts. Um, so but of course, Alec is also on the line here as well. I mean, we have. Uh, as I heard it, uh, our entire rec uh, staff is on furlough right now through June 30th. I don't know how many of our park staff are also on furlough, but I think it's, well, I shouldn't speculate. Um, and uh, so is there a, so it, it put, I, I'm just going to say, I feel like it puts us in kind of a tricky position. Um, to ask for that, but I'm curious for others' thoughts on something like that. And and to be specific, you were you were thinking, Dan, something like rototilling. Um, I was thinking, you know, there there is an industrial strength rototiller, uh, you know, available through recreation. I think that is the kind of thing that could do, you know, what would take a couple of people a day and a half to do could do in, in half an hour. That's why. Yeah, unless know. the entire park or the entire rec staff is not available, right? Like so well, that. that Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, I, okay. Uh, I also was discouraged about thinking that we don't have enough city staff, but you know, there are some incredibly equipped gardeners in our city that would be willing to probably help out. I mean, I'm so impressed with the work you've all done. I hope applaud all those within the SMC group and the CAN neighborhoods that I think if you put out a call, you might be able to find some rototillers and human power. I also think for your flyers that you could talk to Glenn at Capital Copy and I'll bet you he'd give you um, potentially maybe some free, but definitely reduced for your flyers and other copying that you need. We, we I just think don't the rototillers- we don't have any, we have, we have no budget for this other than the people that are, you know, we've got working. So uh, that's, that's, but that's let's go, a problem. Let's go talk to him. He's been known to give. Glenn, Glenn has I think again, to put out a call for rototillers and people who are willing to help if they know where to go. Glenn has offered to, to do public service things um, at, at Capital Copy. And I think if it's making a few copies, I'm sure the city would be happy to help. Even though our budget is pretty strapped, I think if you make a few photocopies, we probably will pick up that tab. We have, you know, they can bill us. So. Okay, well, that, I, I will try it and report back to you. Uh, as far as the rototiller, there's just having seen a, an industrial strength rototiller, it's one of those things where finding people who can spend a, a, a whole day pushing one versus, you know, the one that gets pulled, uh, like I said, does does a whole day's worth of work in 20 minutes. So it's a uh, that that was the idea was to get things done relatively quickly. Uh, Connor. It's, uh, it's definitely an interesting concept to me and something I'd be interested in uh, hearing more about. I, I'm just like a couple of questions about the scale of it then. Would you be looking to like maybe launch this in more a modest fashion? How many lawns are you talking about for like lawn gardens? <coughs> We've had what would, like a good, what would be a good result for like Oh, a good result would be 2025 uh, over the next uh, month. Uh, if we if we don't have stuff in a month from now, uh, the planting season is pretty much past. So it's uh, it's really what can, what can we accomplish in a, you know in a relatively short period of time? I mean, I'll, I'll just say that sounds more achievable than like the number that was in my mind when I envisioned this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that's you know that's what and, we, and we've actually part of part of what we're uh, reaching out with the can neighborhoods et cetera is we're calling them garden mentors which I think Donna speaks to what you and others have talked about you know it's those people in town who actually know what they're doing so we're trying to figure out how to use the can neighborhoods to match those people who have some expertise 
with the people who want it uh, done and uh, figure out how to make the best use of the human capital that we have in town. Uh, Lauren. I just wanted to also say, I mean, I, I think this is a great idea in this year, being able to do a kind of pilot project. And I mean, even Cameron was talking a couple minutes ago about the social media of the city reaching a thousand people, you know, some of that just promotion, connecting people, putting up if you're making how-to videos or things like, I think there, there are things that even with really limited staff and um, financial resources at the moment that could probably be used to help support it. So maybe thinking through some really discreet ways that the city could help promote this. I, I would, you know, hope we could find ways to do that, um, if nothing else. Sure. And one, one thing I would mention, I had to talk with Connor, who was at least offered to explore this, but I'll ask anybody else who might have similar context. Uh, you know, I understand the uh, Department of Agriculture have, may have some COVID money. Uh, and this, this is the kind of project that is directly COVID related. So if uh, the city would be capable of supporting what we're trying to do, you know, to, to look for some support from ag, et cetera, that would be much appreciated. Well, let's keep being in touch about it. Okay, that's, cool. uh, that's what I have to offer tonight. I will, uh, I may be back to knock on doors, but I'll, uh, you know, I just wanted to give you an update on what we're doing. Uh, it's actually been pretty impressive, the outpouring of support that we've uh, experienced so far, and people want to do things. Yeah. Go ahead, Connor. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say, I thought the flyer in was great because, you know, there's all sorts of things we can do with technology to get the word out. Uh, but I think there's no replacement for people just rolling up their sleeves and hitting the doors like they did. Uh, and I heard a lot, a lot of people in the neighborhood who really appreciated getting that information. So um, I, I think that alone, you know, if that was the only thing Can did, it was definitely worth revitalizing for that. So. Oh, yeah, and that actually, that brings up that social media thing. I will be, we will be informing uh, Cameron of the, this, but uh, the, you know, many of the neighborhoods are actually creating their own Facebook pages. Uh, so uh, they're they're actually developing their own identities uh, separately, which is wonderful because it gives you know them a sense of uh, mission, of purpose, et cetera. So uh, we'll keep you informed on that as it comes along. Great, great, great. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Okay, so I think that uh, wraps up. Yeah, the only thing I'm going to add, well, first of all, I think we could deploy Cameron to do all the rototilling. So <laughs> should be covered there. Um, <laughs> there's 20 lawns done in no time. Um, but after after she and Tony finished finish that up, I uh, know. The only other thing, in, in a, you know, I mentioned to you earlier in an executive session, but just publicly, I, I, I believe there's going to be an announcement as early tomorrow about a new fund for to benefit downtown directly related to uh, COVID-19 and supporting our local businesses. Uh, a group of private individuals have put this together. They've raised some private money. And we'll, as soon as we have more details about what it is and how people can donate to it, um, so the city will certainly help partner get that word out uh, about that. So it's very exciting to see not only some local individuals, but some local, uh, some big local businesses really stepping up to help their more struggling neighbors. Great, looking forward to that. It's great news. Um, okay, so we are, uh, we do have a, an other executive session um, scheduled for this evening. So we'll, what's that? And strategic plan too. Uh, oh, and strategic plan. Oh my goodness. Okay, sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> Nine, <laughs> it's only like the most important thing for the year. Um, okay, so uh, it's nine forty-two. I I think we can I think we can do this. Um, the executive session should be very short, unless you don't want it okay. to be. I mean, I can. It's just updating you on who the three finalists are for the police chief. So okay, um, unless folks would prefer to not do the strategic plan tonight, or just approve uh, it as presented. Yeah. Your work. Uh, all right. So, talking about strategic plan, um, I'm going to assume that we've all had a chance to check out that document. Um, I'm 
Cameron, is there anything else, or anything further you wanted to say about it? Um, no, just, uh, th uh, well, I mean, um, thank you guys for, for voting. Um, I think you guys had um, a lot of really great things rise to the top that had the majority vote. Um, I think they're all very important. I do want to say that I tried to emphasize that none of the other initiatives um, that we have presented as staff are going to go away um, and that we did fold a lot of the things that y'all discussed and voted on that we agreed could be done into those initiatives. Um, so that will be presented in full um, when we finish this document. Um, we'll have all of those uh, department level work plans up um, once we finalize those. So it kind of goes, you know, strategic plan and then our um, uh, department initiatives. So nothing is like really going away that we presented to you. Um, so all of your goals have something that support it through this year. Just the ones that you guys have highlighted, the nine that you have highlighted as your priorities are what's going to help us guide us through this year. Doesn't mean that your goals are not being touched um, if you didn't vote that into the top nine. So um, just thank you. Um, I thought this was a really great um, strategic plan and I'm very excited to hear your feedback. Um, I also want to say that um, Jasmine um, Nicely, our uh, assistant in our office, has really helped me um, make a better aesthetic version of this document. So when you all approve it, I have some really exciting visuals to share with you. Cool. I th so I think the question here is, you know, these are essentially what you said were your top priorities. Now, this is your chance to sort of truth that out and either try to lobby each other to change them or uh, go with them or, you know, before you, or just adopt them. But I think this is, that's what the, the question before you is, is this, anybody want to try to sway other votes? I think we provided everything that got votes, right? Yes, in the email. That in the email, right. I was happy with this. Um, you know, not all of the things of my 10 made it onto this list, but you know what? They're, as Cameron said, they're not going away. So I think that's fine. Other comments, Jack? I move that we adopt the strategic plan as presented by the uh, assistant city manager. Uh, it looks like Jay seconded, um, or Dan, maybe both. Uh, any further discussion on this? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Both. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I appreciate it. This was a really um, fun process, and I'm really excited to be part of it. Yeah. Thank you for all your work on on this. Yeah, well, well done. a really good product, I think. Good work. Um, okay. So we'll do council reports, all the reports, and then executive session. Um, I'm going to start in the normal order. Uh, Donna. Uh, had a few neighborhood complaints of people's neighbors. So you can tell people are a little stressed right now, but it's been quiet. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. Okay, uh, Con um, Connor. Yeah, no, I think I'm all good. There was a really nice uh, WCAX piece a day or two ago about Montpelier restaurants up and out, uh, healthcare workers. So good job to everybody in town there. Uh, Jay. Yep, I just want to uh, quickly let everybody know that uh, Green Up Day was rescheduled to the end of May, the 30th. And thanks to Donna and everybody at uh, Public Works for being able to adjust their schedule and be able to support that effort into Montpelier Live to be able to um, uh, sort of uh, pivot and, and join the rest of the, the state uh, on that day. Um, the other piece is it's just a little bit of follow up from from what Dan was talking about is I'm happy to really happy to be a part of the, the uh, coalition that Dan and Montpelier, uh, Sustainable Montpelier are putting together around food security. Um, Dan really has put together a, a great, a strong um, collaborative group of folks um, looking at everything from small front yard gardens uh, up to, you know, larger scale security that could affect our community. So um, I think we could all expect uh, expect more from that group moving forward. So just want to let everybody know about that. Uh, Dan. 
Um, actually, I, uh, I will just echo some of the other um, comments of the counselors. Okie dokie. Uh, Jack. Thank you. I just wanted to note, we, uh, we didn't mention this earlier, but I wanted to note uh, the death last month of Corky Nielsen. Um, some of you may remember Corky. Corky served on the, uh, moved to Montpelier in 1972 and lived here ever since then. And he, he was served three terms on the city council back in the late 80s and early 90s. He obviously loved the city of Montpelier. He did a lot for the community. Uh, there was a time back in 1992 when I on behalf of uh, some community activists sued the city council, actually named the mayor and each member of the city council as defendants, including Corky. And I went out to his house to serve him with the complaint. And he uh, never was any less friendly to me after that. And <laughs> good for him for doing that. There's also a great story that I didn't personally witness but uh, a story of one night when the city council meeting was going on and Corky was sitting at home watching it on television and he was so upset about something that he heard that he got out of his chair, pulled his boot and coats on over his pajamas, got in his car and drove down to city council to, uh, to give the council some So. Cork, Corky was a was a real character and a great uh, resident here, and it's just sad to see him go. Yeah, I witnessed that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Lauren. Um, only thing I would add, which I think, uh, Mayor, you might speak to more, but the. Um, I know most of the committees are on pause right now, but the, um, the group working on the energy ordinance was able to have a couple conversations because there is a grant opportunity. So we can update you all, but it's exciting in this, these really challenging times that maybe there could be some um, funding to help us um, put in place this, this project that will help us towards our net zero community goal. So fingers crossed on that and we can keep you all updated, but um, exciting when some, some positive news could possibly <laughs> be coming. So, great. Um, well, and I don't necessarily need to add more to that. Um, I am just going to say I'm really excited that the tennis courts are open. Um, that's that's a, a big deal. Uh, so, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, John, do you have anything to add? Sorry, I was playing Galaga. Um, <laughs> no, I got nothing. Okay. Cool. Uh, Bill. Um, one serious thing and one lighter thing. I'll do the uh, serious one first. Um, this is really, you've heard me say this, but it's, I think it's just coming up even more. And this has to do with the furloughs. And now that the, some of the restrictions are getting lightened up and tennis courts are out, you know, we, when you heard uh, Cameron's rundown of COVID-19, we're, we're starting to hit that point that we knew we would hit where people are like, well, can't we reserve the fields? Can we do this? And some of it has to do with health regulations. A lot of it has to do with the financial decisions that we've made and to, to preserve our city's budget. We had our you know, team meeting this morning talking about our reopening plan and which we will be getting, I think you may be getting a draft of at some point soon. And um, a lot of that's driven by, you know, who we have for staff. So, uh, you know, we're still on the June 30. So I think you as elected officials could probably expect to keep, you know, over the next couple of weeks, weather's supposed to get really nice the next week and a half, start hearing how come the city's not doing this, how come the city's not doing that. So just remind you that was a policy decision that we all made and it's the next six weeks are going to probably be tense about that. On the lighter note, I also wanted to mention Corky. Uh, thank you, Jack. 
I was going to tell the pajama story, but I have another one too. I hadn't been here more than a couple of weeks starting this job and I was walking around town and I went by the coffee corner and there were four or five older gentlemen, older than probably my age now, but whatever, sitting there in the front. They waved me in. I had no idea who these folks were. Wave. Come in. Say, You're the new city manager, are you? And it was Corky. It was Jim Johnston. And uh, there was one other guy. Oh, um, yeah, Sam Fitzpatrick. And they're sitting there. And they're, you know, they said, listen, if you ever want to know what's going on in the town, you ever want to know how a bond issue is going to go, how the budget vote's going to go, you come down and you, you talk to us and have coffee. And whatever we tell you, the other thing's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and that actually proved to be pretty true. So it was like a good bellwether. <laughs> that was pretty funny. That's all I get. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, that is the end of our regular business for this evening. Um, we have a quick executive session and we are not going to likely return uh, to make any decisions after that. Uh, Jack. Pursuant to 1VSA section 313A3, I move we go into executive session to discuss the appointment of a public official. I'll second. second. Okay. For the discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? John, I'll get the notes from here. Okay. So we, again, we leave this meeting and go to the other one. Okay. Bye. See you, see you later.